at your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Isn't it about time for somebody's favorite radio program? Yeah. 97.3 ESPN presents The Sports Bash with Mike Gill. When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. I can't see him, but he talks to me. Now, live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. Josh Eddie Clear for Mike Gill on a hump day Wednesday on 97.3 ESPN as... Boy, folks, the word frustrated, that's the word of the day, in part because I felt like every person I heard, whether it was a player, a manager, or a coach, or a fan, expressed similar verbiage in the Phillies' 5 nothing loss yesterday. That's now four straight losses for the Phillies. We got a lot to get to on today on the Sports Bash. Let me give you a quick rundown before I get deep into the Phillies here. On 97.3 ESPN. So, here's the itinerary for today. Today is the first day we are giving away tickets to go see Andrew Scholes in concert next Saturday at Ovation Hall inside Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City. So, keep it tuned to find out how you can win a pair of tickets to go see the comedian, actor, and podcaster perform on Saturday August 23rd. That's number one. Number two. We got a busy lineup today. Mike McGarry for the Press of Atlantic City coming up in about 25 minutes from now. Football on four with Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast. Nick's Nuggets at 4.30 this evening. Matt Gell from The Athletic will join us at 5 o'clock. And then for those who are listeners to Game night here on 97.3 ESPN, which I am usually on, except when I'm filling in for Mike Gill. We usually have Weinberg Wednesdays. Today, Dave Weinberg will join us at 5.25 tonight instead of his usual 6.20 slot. So, a packed show coming up. And as well, you guys can join the conversation, which some of you already have, at 609-403-0973. Your DMs also are open for the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. Literally two hours before this show even began. Text messages were already coming in complaining about the Phillies. And I'm not going to ignore it. I will get to it. But as I opened, the word frustrated is the key word. And before I get to what people were saying last night specifically, I just want to give you give you guys my reaction because I like the word frustrated because we know this Phillies team is better than they have played recently. We know that the 2024 Phillies team was on a historic run. The first half of the season. But the second half of the season, this team has only won seven games since the All-Star break. And I think that we have all gotten to the point where everyone wants to point the finger and blame somebody. But the reality is, is that I don't think it's fair to just blame anyone at this point. You know, to paraphrase what Jason Kelsey once said, it's the whole team. When you watch that game last night, there's never a point in time where any of us are, if you're being honest and fair, are looking around and saying one person is more at fault than another. There was a pitcher on the mound 
that 99% of you have never heard of in your life. Valente Balazzo. You had trouble getting a single hit off the guy for seven innings. And in a game where Kyle Schwarber, Trey Turner, Alec Bohm, Bryson Stott, and Brandon Marsh all go over, none of them can get a hit in the game. Which is ironic because the guy they pinch hit for last night was Rojas and not Marsh, and Rojas had a hit last night. But you think about all the money and all the resources have been invested into these guys. Schwarber, Turner. A lot of money. A lot of money in those two guys, right? How about all the years of development for Alec Bohm and Bryson Stott from the minors to the majors? You didn't give up a massive haul to get Brandon Marsh, but you gave up enough to at least kind of make you question, was it worth it, right? And we talked so much heading into the All-Star break about how this team needed to upgrade the right-handed bat situation off the bench. And they did in the most literal sense. They got rid of Christian Pache and Whit Merrifield, and they brought in Austin Hayes. Well, now Austin Hayes is injured, and we don't know when he's coming back. And last night, the Phillies mustered five hits in the entire game. Against a Marlins bullpen that is nowhere as good as they used to be because they've traded multiple guys away at the deadline. A team that no longer has Josh Bell for you to worry about. A team that no longer has half the talent they had earlier this year. And you let Jake Berger beat you. That's why the word frustrated comes up. Because at the end of the day, we know that the Phillies team that won 19 games in April, 20 games in May, and 15 in June, we know that that team is still there. But they're not playing up to their potential. And that's why it was interesting when Kyle Schwarber said this to the media last night after the Phillies' 5 nothing loss to the Marlins. I think it's frustration just because, you know, we, we know who, what we can be and what kind of team we can be. I think worry is the wrong kind of word, right? That, you know, if you're worried about, you know, where you're at, that's, it's not a good thing to be. And, uh, you know, frustration, you, you can have frustration. You know, I, that, that, that's a natural thing to have. The where, you know, you, you feel like that, you know, you could be going through a skid and everyone would be frustrated, right? And that's when it comes back to us coming back together as a, as a unit and digging right back into, into the hole, right? And, and fighting our way out of it. It's a very interesting perspective because what Schwarber's telling you is two different messages. Number one, the players are not worried. They're frustrated. And he's, he's drawing a straight delineation, a straight divide in that conversation. And I think it's a very interesting delineation because what Kyle Schwarber is telling you indirectly is that the players know they are going to find their way out of this. The players know that they are believing. They believe they can get out of this situation. So, is it is it enough to believe the players? Is it enough for Philly fans to look at the players and say they're frustrated but they believe they can get out of this? Because I got to tell you guys, if I go off based off of social media last night, I think a lot of you are bailing on this team. And it's not just because they lost four straight games. It's the way they lost the four straight games. When you lose by more than four runs for three straight games, we have a lot of questions about the offense. 
And I asked the question yesterday to Frank Close during his Phillies mailbag segment. We asked the same question on Monday to Greg Murphy when it was me and Nick Earnshaw here filling in for Mike Gill on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. The question we kept asking is, Is there something that can be done with the lineup? Is it just about the players getting out of their own way? And I said it tongue in cheek, but maybe there is something to the fact that maybe all of these guys should have taken like a day at the Jersey Shore or something because I don't know what is going on with Trey Turner. I do not understand why Harper is having some of these bad at bats. It doesn't make any sense why Bryson Stott is still playing this poorly. But what I do understand is that the frustrations of the players are real. And you heard Schwarber express that. But the other part of it is he believes they will get out of it. He says that they have gone through losing streaks before like this, and he believes they will pull themselves out of it. We've done this before. You know, I think that's the that's the thing to, to go back on is that we've gone through similar things in the past and we've found our way to, to come out on the other side and that's what we're going to have to be able to do is come together. And I think that is the interesting part of this. You let me know, 609-403-0973. And your DMs into 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. The players believe they will find their way out of this. Schwarber says, hey, we've been through losing streaks like this before. The players are saying that if you go through the last couple seasons, the 2022-2023 seasons, that they found their way out of bad losing streaks. Which is interesting because in my own mind, you know, you don't think of the losing streaks as much in the past because of the reality that they made deep playoff runs. But in 2023, their longest losing streak was six games. And you may or may not remember, but this was a team that did struggle in May and July of that season. What about 2022? Well, that was the year they fired Joe Girardi and made Rob Thompson the manager. That season, their longest losing streak was five games. And they did it three times in 2022. So we're talking about a team that had a six-game losing streak in 2023 and three five-game losing streaks in 2022. So then I ask, is it legitimate for me and you to trust the players that they will find their way out of it? I'm conflicted because for me, I look at the Phillies and I see a team that has a bad approach at the plate. Their hitters are not taking the right approach. That's why I asked the question yesterday, here on 97.3 ESPN about, you know, is potentially the real problem with this team not Rob Thompson? Is it maybe Kevin Long? Has Kevin Long lost his touch as the hitting coach? Or am I to believe that it's just the players taking a bad approach at the plate? And even Rob Thompson used the same word frustrated. He understands how it is perceived by the fans. Rob Thompson last night after the loss. They're frustrated, you know, because they know that we're better than that. And and our fans know that we're better than that. And we have very knowledgeable fans, and, and they let you know when you're not playing well. And, hey, that's it is what it is. That's the game. And I know that's an answer that people may not like. It's not a charismatic answer. It doesn't steal the headlines. It, it almost sounds like a laissez-faire, like, oh, well, you know, it is what it is. But Rob Thompson believes the Phillies will turn this around. And I got to admit, it sounds a little like the same thing that Kyle Schwarber said. Because we've been through this before, maybe not this prolonged, 
but you look at the numbers on the back of their baseball cards, I always bring that up. I believe in this team. They're resilient. They're tough. They care. I think we're, I know we're going to turn around. So both the manager and the players believe they will turn this around in part because of who the players are, in part because of their history, in part because they've done it before. Is that enough for you to believe? Text board is open at 609-403-0973. Your DMs into the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank. See how Pat from Ocean City, he chimed in two plus hours before the show started today. Because he wanted to be first in line to speak his mind. Pat from Ocean City says, I still don't think Rob Zombie, meaning Rob Thompson, needs to do anything. In 2011, Charlie Manuel came out to the media and said, do not blame Milt Thompson for the hitting woes. This is on the players. Rob Zombie, he means Rob Thompson, needs to sit the immature clown with a beard and stop. You got to change it up. Still, there's been no accountability from Rob Thompson. That's from Pat in Ocean City. Well, Pat, first of all, look, I understand where you're coming from. But I think the problem is, Pat, when it, when it comes to your description of Rob Thompson, you're referring to a guy who is a laid-back manager, like Charlie Manuel was. You know, you mentioned in 2011 what Charlie Manuel said about Milt Thompson. You overlooked the fact that Charlie Manuel was always this kind of like, you know, laid back, you know, oh, hum, wasn't the most fiery, passionate guy in the world. And fans complained about Charlie Manuel and disliked Charlie before he won a championship. As soon as he won a championship, he was beloved. He was understood. He was appreciated. So, I, I don't think I don't think there's a huge difference between Rob Thompson and Charlie Manuel. And again, that's 2011 Charlie Manuel. Charlie Manuel never said stuff like that in 2006, 2007, 8, 9, 10. So that was years into his tenure where he was basically, he could basically have managed as long as he wanted. He, he was revered. So I don't think it's it's fair to compare Rob Thompson to Charlie Manuel in that sense. I understand for a lot of you Philadelphia sports fans, you don't like a manager like Rob Thompson. You like Larry Boa. You like the fiery manager. But the reality is the fiery manager doesn't win a lot of games in baseball anymore. I'm saying more and forever. You know, Joe Torre wasn't the fieriest manager in the world, but he won a ton of... World Series with the Yankees. Terry Francona won a bunch of World Series with the Red Sox. And he wasn't out there biting the uh, the umpire's head off all the time. I think that there's a perception that Rob Thompson doesn't care at times. And I don't think that's true at all. I just think Rob Thompson has just a low pulse. I just don't think he's a guy who's going to just... Rob Thompson is the opposite of Nick Sirianni, which is ironic because some of you out there hate when Nick Sirianni gets all emotional, but then you get mad that Rob Thompson doesn't get emotional. So it's like we we, we got to find a middle ground there. To Pat Promotion's point about, um, I believe when you mean the immature clown with the beard, you mean Brandon Marsh, and you mentioned Bryson Stott. The Stott issue... I don't have a good answer for it. I'm not trying to be dismissive of your point because you're 100% right. What Stott has done this year doesn't make any sense. And that's why I point to Kevin Long. Not because I'm a, I'm a Kevin Long hater or I want people fired, but because how does a guy go from being an up-and-coming star in this league to a player who is seemingly unable to do anything right. Bryson Stott has gone from a guy with a 280 batting average last year to a 232 this year. That is an incredible drop off. He went from having an on base percentage of 329 to 309. Again, another serious drop off. Slugging percentage, 419 last year. 343 this year. 
And if he continues to pace these on, he will get nowhere near the 62 RBI that he had last year. He might get close to the stolen base number, but he's not going to get close to the RBI number. He has half the hits right now than he had last year. And it's only about 40 less games. So where do we draw the line between saying Bryson Stott is the problem and somebody is giving him bad advice? I said it a couple times this week. To me, I look at Stott as a guy who needs to be in a platoon. I think we need to give more at-bats to Edmundo Sosa. I've been saying that for a while, and I will continue to say that. It's my position, and I'm sticking to it. I don't think Stott needs to be playing as much as he is. I think we have gotten past the point where Stott is... Stott is not going to get hit himself out of this situation. He's not going to work his way out. He's not going to get, you know, find a way, you know. He's given us nothing this year that shows us that he can get out of this rut. Now, on the flip side, Brandon Marsh has. Because while many people can point to, in the last eight games, Brandon Marsh has an 0 batting average. Well, what about the previous eight games? Well, before the most recent eight-game stretch, the past nine games, he had two home runs, seven RBIs, was batting 270. So, to me, the difference is is that maybe Marsh needs a day off, a day off, Pat and Ocean City, but I, I think the problem with Stott is much deeper. And I think that's a little bit more of, of a conundrum. Sure. Bench Marsh for a day, but I mean, what is that going to do? Am I supposed to get excited about that? Am I supposed to be like, oh man, they they benched Brandon Marsh? No. I, I, I look at it as Marsh is a streaky hitter. He's not somebody that you can depend on, basically. He is what he is, right? That's kind of how I look at him. Charlie and Violin chimes in on the text board at 609-403-0973. He says, after last night's performance, I'm debating on going to the game tonight or not. The poor performance all around by this Phillies team. Ask Charlie from Violin. Charlie, I don't think you're alone. I, I think that for a Phillies team that has had really great attendance in the last few years, I would not be surprised that if they keep struggling the way they are, if the attendance for the next few home games drops off. Not that people aren't going to go and it's going to be like 5,000 people or something, but, you know, maybe instead of having 40,000, there'll be 30,000. There'll be 28,000, right? Because last night's game had 42,000 people. I have trouble believing we're going to see 42,000 again tonight. I know the Phillies have consistently been getting good attendance at home this year. But like I said, I think there's some frustration from the fans that will probably come out in attendance. I don't think Charlie in Millville is alone in that. I'm sorry, Charlie from Violent is alone in that. Cole from LBI chimes in at 609-403-097 says, I would be extremely concerned if I was a Phillies fan about how the Phillies have played under 500 since June. The fact that they are below 500 in one-run games as well. It's the same thing that hurt them in the playoffs last year. They had trouble winning close games without playing small ball. But, Cole, it goes back to the construction of the roster, right? It's the idea that, as I've said multiple times here on 97.3 ESPN, Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill, Dave Dombrowski said we are going to out-hit our problems. He has said multiple times that we have an offense, that we have invested a lot of money and a lot of resources in, that we are expecting them to bash our way, smash our way out of this. So if they built the team with that idea in mind, something's got to change, Cole, from LBI. They, They can't be just like, well, we'll eventually come around. No, they got to, you know, put up or shut up at this point. It's it's really getting difficult. And as I said, the word frustrated is the word of the day. 
everyone keeps saying they're frustrated. But is saying you're frustrated enough? Doesn't sound like it is for Phillies fans. I'll get them all your text a little bit later this hour. Keep them coming at 609-403-0973. Your DMs into the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank. And see how coming up next, Mike Begay of the Press of Atlantic City here on the Sports Bash. Josh Eddie hanging out with you on a hump day Wednesday on 97.3 ESPN. You're listening. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. With Mike Gill. Never thought this radio stunt would catch on so big. On 97.3 ESPN. Josh Eddie filling in for Mike Gill here in a Wednesday edition of the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. We'll get back to the text board in just a bit as the text board is popping off at 609 403 0973. Kyle Schwarber and Rob Thompson, a similar message last night. They said people are frustrated. The players are frustrated. They said the fans are frustrated. But they believe that they have turned it around. They can turn it around. They've done it before. They say they can do it again. The Phillies had three five-game losing streaks during the 2022 season when they went to the World Series. So we'll ask Mike McGarry from the press of Atlantic City, Mike Is it enough for Philly fans to believe when Rob Thompson and Kyle Schwarber say that they're frustrated, but they will turn it around? Yeah, well, I would suggest or or hope that fans would head over to pressofac.com and and take a look at my latest must-win. Two weeks ago, I told you all is calm. Don't push the panic button. Uh, Today... Uh, panic away. Get, uh, push that panic button as, as hard as you can. This situation right now is not trending in a good direction, and this team must stop it immediately. And it starts tonight, and it's going to need more than just words. It's going to need actual actions on the baseball field. So you mentioned action. What is an action that can be done. Like, for example, we had people texting in saying Rob Thompson needs to bench Bryson Stott, or people are saying that they need to shake up the batting lineup. Like, is that doing something like that enough action for you, Mike McGarry? Yeah, well, again, in, in the, in the must win, I just wrote at pressofac.com, I kind of single out Brandon Marsh and, and Bryson Stott only for the reasons that they are not producing and they are young players. They don't have the track record. Uh, of the veterans. And and look, the veterans haven't been good. Trey Turner has turned every ground ball into an adventure at shortstop. Bryce Harper has not been good. Schwaber has not been good. JT Realmuto has been awful since he's come back. But Brandon Marsh and Bryson Stott, and I have the articles, the six, the statistics in the article, the must win that I wrote, they have been Terrible. They are not Supreme Court justices. They are not guaranteed positions <laughs> for life. Get these guys out of here. I don't care what you've got to do. Take them out of the batting order and play Amando Sosa in the case of Bryson Stott. I would even think about sending one or two of them back to AAA for two weeks. You cannot tolerate this performance. You know, Josh, this is not... This is not... Uh, uh, you know, I heard you talking about five-game losing streak, a bad weekend, bad week. They are 24 and 30 since they got back from London. That is 54 games. That is exactly 33% of the season. They are six games under 500. You look at their overall record. They're 69 and 50, right? So what do they have? What do they have? 43 games left in the regular season. We thought this team was going to win a hundred something games this year. They are in danger if they keep playing at the current pace of not winning 90 games. 90. So something has got to change, and this lack of performance cannot be tolerated. And unfortunately, you can't send a message to Trey Turner, Bryce Harper, Rio Muto, Schwaber, Castellanos, because they're veterans with big salaries. But you can send a message with Brandon Marsh and Bryce and Scott, and that message has to be sent. 
it goes back to the question I asked a couple of days ago. Talking with Mike Begay of the Press of Atlantic City, his must win columns over at the Press of Atlantic City dot com. When you think about the ninety three Phillies team, that team was a heavy platoon team, right? They did not have many guys on that team who were starting every day. So I don't understand why we need Stott and Marsh to play every day if they're not contributing. Like you said, if Amundo Sosa is the better player right now, well, who cares, you know, about Stott's feelings or whatever, right? Like, I don't understand why in, in 2024, the Phillies just can't be like, you know what? This guy's playing better. Bryson, you're going to sit until Sosa can't hit anymore. Well, I believe that's where we've got to get to. Those guys do not have the track record. Rob Thompson talked last night. He always talks about the back of the baseball card. Well, J.T. Riamuto's got a back of the baseball card. Bryce Harper's got a back of the baseball card. Trey Turner has a back of the baseball card. Brandon Marsh and Bryson Stott's back of the baseball card goes one or two years. I think the biggest disappointment so far in this Philly season has been Stott and Marsh's inability to take the next step forward and become players, everyday players that people envision them being. Now, they got away with it early in the season when Ranger Suarez was throwing zeros up on the scoreboard and Jeff Hoffman and Matt Strom were striking everybody out. But they're not getting away with it now when this whole team is headed south. And again, I go back to something. 69 and 50, uh, 43 games left. This team has basically got to play 500, and if they play 500, they're going to win just over 90 games. Josh, we all thought this team was going to win 100, 500, 600, 708 games, you know, a couple months ago. They're going to struggle to get to 90 now. This has to stop, uh, you know, uh, or it's going to be, or there's going to be changes made. And if they don't make the changes now in the regular season, they're going to make them after the season. Well, speaking of changes, Mike, I asked this question before and I'll ask it to you here. Do we have to point the finger a bit at Kevin Long? I mean, this is a major statistical drop off by Bryson Stott from last year to this year. Remember the whole point of acquiring Brandon Marsh was, well, Kevin Long will fix him, right? You know, at what point is it the players and how, at what point is it the hitting coach? Well, you know, it's, it's always the players to me especially in, in, in baseball. I understand things can be tweaked, you have philosophies of hitting, things like that. Kevin Long has been a successful hitting coach in the big leagues for a long time. You know, changing a hitting coach now or a pitching coach now is not going to do you a whole lot of good. Changing it after the season, yeah, those changes could come if this team continues to play like it has, you know, over the last 54 games. But I don't think making those changes now, I always put the onus on the players, uh, not the coaches, uh, you know, so far. Because, you know, Kevin Long was the hitting coach last year when Bryson Stott looked poised to take the next step. He just hasn't taken it this year. That's not Kevin Long's fault. That's Bryson Stott's fault. Okay, so you're so basically, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you're saying, look, if you want to have a conversation about the coaching staff after the year, we can have it then. But right here on August 14th, we got to look, you know, solely at the players. Absolutely, and what I mean by change is, look, they collapse and they continue down this path, or they're eliminated early in the postseason. Then I think you're looking at, uh, you know, changes in personnel, and I think you know you might look at the manager at that point and say. Maybe we need a different voice there or different coaches or whatever if this continues on the path they're going right now. But right now, August 14th, changing coaches, I agree. The players have just got to get their act together. You know, Kyle Schwab said last night that he doesn't think any changes are needed, that they have talented guys in the clubhouse to get it done. Well, go get it done. It's August 14th. This team is 7-16 and 16 since the All-Star break. Only the Chicago White Sox. The lowly Chicago White Sox are worse. So it is time to panic, and it is time to start winning, and it has to start tonight. Uh, and this is a problem that can't be solved with one win tonight. I reserve judgment. This has got to take two to three weeks of them playing better to turn it around before I feel about this team the way I felt in April, May, and June. So if I can backtrack something you just said, because what you just said, I know there are people in our listening audience here on 97.3 ESPN are pumping their fists at the radio right now, Mike, not against you, but in agreement with you. Because you mentioned about Rob Thompson, about is there a possibility they may need to change the person, the voice 
in that clubhouse. If this team doesn't make a deep postseason run, what percentage of a hot seat are you putting on Rob Thompson then? And how likely is it that Rob Thompson wouldn't be here? Well, I think if this team continues to play like they have so far and finishes out the season like they have so far and they get eliminated early from the playoffs, then all bets are off, and I wouldn't be surprised at anything they do. If they sort of right the ship and get in the playoffs and win a series or two, make a run at the World Series, then I think things are safe. You know, but if this team keeps playing like this, where they're arguably the worst team in baseball, throwing the Chicago White Sox out since the All-Star break, who knows what's going to happen uh, once the regular season ends. That's why I'm advocating for changes now. Shake it up now so you can maybe get back on a winning way and you don't have to uh, make big changes in the offseason. Because the way the Phillies are playing right now, this this loses jobs. I mean, J.T. Rio, you don't throw in the ball in the left field. Again, Trey Turner, can he feel the ground ball? Every ground ball hit to him. It's an adventure. <laughs> yes. it's a, and then catches it. You're holding your breath because you don't know if he's going to throw it in the first base stand. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Mike McGarry for the Press of Atlantic City doing his uh, – Best Chris Mad Dog Russo impersonation here on 97.3 ESPN. I feel like I'm listening to Mad Dog right now. I'm not listening to Mike McGarry anymore here. But look, at pressofac.com, I must win. Two weeks ago, I told you to relax. Now I'm telling you, you know, get out on the ledge. It's time to panic. Push the panic button. Whatever you got to do, because this team right now is headed in the wrong direction. And it is. this is not a little slump. This team is playing sloppy baseball. This team got, you know, uh, basically shut out by a guy who, making his fifth major league start last night who throws the ball 90 miles an hour. I mean, they've got to correct this, and they've got to correct it in a hurry. Well, part of the reason why people are panicking also, Mike, is you mentioned a couple minutes ago about Jeff Hoffman. And this bullpen was a strength and a staple of this team with – Hoffman and Strom in the first half. And at the time of the deadline, it looked like a good move when they upgraded Gregory Soto and Sir Anthony Dominguez, right? You know, they bring in a new righty, a new lefty to replace Dominguez and replace Soto, and you thought that was enough. But I got to tell you, Mike, now I look back on the deadline, and I'm getting Sixer vibes. I'm getting... Daryl Morey only acquiring Buddy Heald and doing nothing else at the deadline. Is it fair to say right now that Dave Dombrowski did not do enough at the deadline? Well, we'll see. The one thing I will say about the bullpen is Hoffman pitched well last night, I thought. and But on the flip side, Estevez gave up a home run. And right now, I don't have a lot of faith in Estevez in a big spot, even though he's pitched just a couple of games for the Phillies. Hasn't looked like a world beater to me. Gives up the home run last night. So, yeah, it's, uh, again, it's everything. It's starting pitching. Uh, it's bullpen. It's uh, batting order. It's the stars not hitting. It's the role players not hitting. The whole situation is not good. And that's why you're 7-16 and 16 since the All-Star break. And only the Chicago White Sox are worse at 2-21. and 21. So, uh this is a team that is in big, big trouble. Now, there's time to fix it. There's, what, 42, 43 games left. There's plenty of time to fix it. There's plenty of time to get hot. We've seen teams get hot in September. We saw the Diamondbacks last year. We saw the Phillies in 2022. We saw the Nationals in 2019. We saw the Braves in 21, particularly in the National League. We've seen teams get hot, go on playoff runs. But right now, this team doesn't look like it's ready to run anywhere uh, except to the golf course in the offseason. Mike, with all that being said, before I let you go, somebody texted in earlier. They said about how they were considering about going to the game tonight, but now with this losing streak, they are not. The Phillies have had really good attendance this year. Is there a possibility during this home stretch that the fans and attendance start waning a bit? Well, I don't think attendance starts waning, but I think the fans start exercising their uh 
you know, their views with their lungs. They did it last night. The boos were out quickly for Taiwan Walker in the first thing. There were plenty of boos when Bryson Stott grounded out to end that game. Hey, the ballpark is a great place to be. It's a fun place to be. Even if your team is the 62 Mets, the ballpark is still a good place to be on a summer night. So I tell everybody, come on out to the ballpark and enjoy yourself. However, I think those fans are going to express their displeasure with their lungs if the Phillies continue to play like this. He's Mike McGarry for the Press of Atlantic City. Follow him on the Twitter platform at AC Press McGarry and all of his coverage of the Phillies and more at PressOfAtlanticCity.com. Mike, appreciate you jumping on today and enjoy the game tonight no matter what the outcome is. All right, folks. We'll see you down the road. Thank you. Josh Eddick filling in for Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash on 973 ESPN, live in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios. And, of course, don't forget, we will be giving away tickets coming up on the show to go see Andrew Scholes Saturday, August 24th at Ovation Hall. We have tickets for you. A couple pairs today, a couple pairs tomorrow. Tune in. When we learn next hour how you can win a pair of tickets right here. On the Sports Bash, Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. More your texts coming up on the other side, 609-403-0973. And your DMs into the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. This. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. With Mike Gill. Do I have everybody's attention now? On 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Josh, any filling for Mike Gill here on 97.3 ESPN. All right. Let's get the text board. And then coming up next hour, I'm going to tell you how you can win tickets to go see Andrew Schultz at Ovation Hall inside Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City on Saturday, August 24th. That'll be the next hour. But right now, as promised, text board is open. 609-403-0973. A lot of people commenting on the Phillies. Tom from the Villa said, I think people need to remember a few things. The manager is given a script to follow each game. It's not all his fault. Number two is a 162 game season. A lot can happen in those games. And unfortunately, the bad is happening now. Tom from the Villas goes on to say, it's a long season. There's plenty of time to turn around. Tom from the Villas is, is correct on both of those fronts, but I do have one slight disagree with him. So I want to tell you what I agree with, what I disagree with here. You're 100% right. It is not all Rob Thompson's fault. Rob Thompson does what the people above him want him to do. Joe Girardi didn't follow the script. He didn't follow the game plan. It's part of the reason why he was fired. A lot of times in baseball, when managers get fired, it's because they're not doing what the front office wants them to do. So keep that in mind when it comes to Rob Thompson. He's he's 100% right is Tom from the Vols about that. And you're also right that it's a long season, a lot can happen. But I think, Tom, the reason why I don't think it's as simple as saying there's plenty of time to turn around is because, as Mike McGarry was saying, some of these are patterns. Some of these are Bryson Stott has not played well all season, right? It's the idea that Brandon Marsh has been streaky all year. It's the fact that you theoretically could have done more at the deadline, and you didn't. It's the fact that, as Mike McGarry said, the Phillies have a losing record since returning from London. So, I just have a lot of questions about this team moving forward, Tom, from the Villas. I hope you're right. I hope they do have plenty of time to turn around. But the problem is, the problem is, we're running out of plenty of time, and now it's becoming much sooner than that. Uh, Jeff from Ocean City chimes in and says, it's Talent Heritage tonight at the bank, so expect a sellout. Yeah, probably. 
it's weird because for some of these like nights, like the Heritage nights, the giveaway nights, doesn't matter if he's playing well or not, people are gonna show up anyway. So that's a good point by you, uh, Jeff from Motion City. Jeff from EHT, a different Jeff says, it's the dog days of summer. Do we really think his team is gonna win 116 games? Come on, they're built for the playoffs. I will say this, Jeff from EHT, I didn't think they'd win 116 games, but I thought they'd win at least 100 some games. And this this winning streak is making you think they're more like a 95 win team when it's all said and done than a 105 win team. I don't think a lot of fans thought they were going to win 116 games though. I I think that that's more of a, a gross exaggeration for the most part. But I hear what you're saying overall. All right, more sports sports bash coming up next on 97.3 ESPN. This is the Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Now live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. Three o'clock hour of the Sports Bash here on 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hitting. Going in for Mike Gill. Dower being brought to you by Broadleys. Plumbing, heating, and air conditioning. Broadleys is your trusted source for air conditioning, heating, and plumbing service and installation plus maintenance for generations. Call them at 609 390 3907 or visit them online at broadleys.net. Don't forget, still to come, we got football for Jeff Bush, who joins the show from the Inside the Birds podcast, InsideTheBirds.com. Nick's Nuggets at 4.30 with all that stuff from Nick Earnshaw, whatever's going on in his mind today. Plus, Matt Gelb from The Athletic. We'll get back to the Phillies with Matt Gelb as well, coming up at 5 p.m. tonight. And Weinberg Wednesday on the Sports Bash. No game night tonight, so Dave Weinberg will join me on the Sports Bash at 5.25 tonight. But right now, as promised, this is the hour for you to win a pair of tickets to go see Andrew Schultz perform Saturday, August 24th. So now there's two shows that day. So these are the tickets for the 1030 show at Ovation Hall, Saturday, August 24th. So if you want to get a pair of tickets, these tickets are almost completely sold out for both shows. All right. Ocean Casino Resort was kind enough to give 97.3 ESPN a call and say, look, we know your listeners want to go see this guy. We have put aside a couple tickets just for your listeners. So what you got to do, because we're talking some football right now. Text in to 609-403-0973. Tell me. What is a realistic expectation that you have for the Eagles this year? Will they be better than last year and why? Text the word ocean and your thoughts on the Eagles. Because I've been really trying to consume as much football content as possible. Because I'm with Terry and Galloway. There's a part of me that says I don't even care about baseball anymore. I can't wait for football season to get here. For those who don't know well enough. If you haven't been listening to 97.3 for the last several years, you should know by now that football is my favorite sport. So if I ever have an excuse to talk football, no matter what time of, time of year it is, I'm going to talk it. And there were a couple of comments made this week by different individuals that definitely made me think about why the Eagles will be better this year. And One of them is by an Eagles player. One of them is by an Eagles coach. And one of those comments, well, we've played it before, but I'm going to bring it back for you again, is by a former player as well. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Philadelphia Eagles are in the spotlight they're in. Because when you look at this roster right now, there are distinct position battles going on. Inside linebacker. Outside corner, nickel corner, backup safety. They're all on the defensive side of the ball. I understand that the national media has talked a lot about Nick Sirianni. They've talked a lot about Jalen Hurts. But Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni don't play defense. The Eagles defense was borderline defense. 
an abomination last year. They were among the worst in the NFL in points allowed per game. They were among the worst in the NFL in pass defense. They were so horrible last year that even when they changed the defensive play caller from Sean Desai to Matt Patricia, they got worse. You could argue that they lost two games. Of the, you know, that six or seven games they lost at the end of the year, they could have won two of those games if the defense didn't play like trash. If the defense didn't play horribly. Because guess what? They did play bad. And Brandon Graham has pointed to coaching as being a difference from last year to this year. This was Brandon Graham on ESPN Radio. I didn't think we had all the right coaches in the proper spots that could help us whatever the size message was because it was just a bunch of miscommunication. That's all. That's what I would just say. It was just miscommunication that I know how we uh, regret it after the season. Funny because we've heard reports telling us that there was a lot of communication problems among the Eagles' defensive coaches. A lot of issues when it came with Sean Desai and communicating with his players. Brandon Graham said this to the media at training camp. We got a good coach in uh, Clint, and I, I really think that last year we just didn't. We, we that's what we didn't have. Uh, we didn't have all the right coaches in the right position. You know, I, I would say and. You know, you can just see the guys just truly believing in what, what we got going on. And I'm excited for the young guys that just came in, the new new uh, rookies coming in. They're really going to get a good shot and a uh, good taste of what it, what it really is to be in the NFL. See, we could talk all we want about the offense. Jalen Hurts, Nick Sirianni, okay? I understand that's what the hot take artists, what the people who like to get calls and clicks and tweets and get people all riled up with opinions and stuff. That's what they like to talk about, right? But I'm here to tell you that, to me, the reason why the Eagles will be better this year is because of the defense. I think Vic Fangio is going to have a tremendous impact in changing how this team is moving forward. And I think part of it is because of who Vic Fangio is. Fangio is going to play the best players. He's not going to play guys because they're the veteran or they should play. Like, did anybody think Isaiah Rodgers would be getting this many first-team reps ahead of Quinion Mitchell in training camp? I didn't think so, for sure. Did anybody think that Quinion Mitchell would be getting this many first-team reps ahead of Avante Maddox at training camp? I certainly didn't think so. Well, Vic Fangio explained that he wants to play the best players. I'm all for playing the best guys. I think if you looked at my history when we've had rookies, we've played them. And um, provided they're good enough. We ain't playing somebody just because they're young. You know, if we were an expansion team like I was in two places, we might just throw them out there to see what we got. But we, we got more serious business here. So if they're worthy of playing, they will play. I think that's one of the biggest changes from last year to this year is the coaching. Brandon Graham mentioned it. We've heard other players mention about how the coaching was a problem last year, right? Lane Johnson, Jason Kelsey, they've all mentioned it. The Eagles told you indirectly that coaching was a problem last year by firing 90% of the coaching staff from last year. This organization looked at the defensive side of the ball and said this was unacceptable for the level of talent that we have. Remember, for as frustrated as we were with the Eagles offense, they were still top 10 in the NFL in scoring. It's not like the Eagles' offense fell off a cliff last year. The biggest problem was on the defensive side of the ball. And when I heard Lane Johnson say this to Chris Long on the Greenlight Podcast, it really started making me wonder if we have underestimated 
or not talked enough about how Vic Fangio may be the difference in this team's success this year. We're so used to like you know basic defenses during training camp, and every now and then you would see a defense like his two or three times a year, maybe. Yeah. But now we're getting all the hard stuff and all of our hard calls out of the way. So when it goes back to you know playing other teams, it should be a lot simpler. Think about that for a minute. He said we would typically see a defense like Vic Fangio's a couple times a year, maybe three times a year. He says, now we're seeing that defense in practice. It's going to make it simpler for us during the season. Again, this is a team that was averaging 25 points per game last year. Seventh in the NFL in points per game scored. This is an offense that I understand it was not as good as the year before. Okay? In numerous statistical categories. But you obviously upgraded the offensive coordinator. To me, the big question is, is Vic Fangio enough to fix the defense? A defense that was the second worst in the NFL of the past. They were third worst in points allowed per game. And don't forget, they were bottom 10 in the NFL on turnovers forced. They were bad, folks. We don't talk enough about how the defense lost them the Cardinals game on New Year's Eve. How the defense was pathetic against the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday Night Football. If those two games are played differently, who knows how that season ends. And the Eagles have two more wins by the end of the year. Do they end up playing Tampa in the postseason? Maybe they don't. Maybe they play somebody else. Maybe the team doesn't have such bad vibes. Maybe the team doesn't have so much negativity and bad energy. Maybe this team would have been better. And considering how bad it got last year. Now, take it as you will. Zach McPherson is a backup on the Eagles. He's a guy fighting for a roster spot. But this is what he said about last year. It's so um, tricky to get into. And, you know, obviously in my position, I I can't really say too much. But I just felt like, uh, you know, we lost sight of the goal um, in a a way. You know, that that goes everybody included from coaches all the way down to the players. But, I mean... (sighs) It was just, we were in such a rough spot. You know, we tried to dig ourselves out, but we just couldn't stop the bleeding. Couldn't stop the bleeding. Players, coaches, everybody lost sight of the goal. So now, you got a coordinator who says, I'm going to play the best players. You got players saying, man, this Fangio is already making a difference. And the the coaches under him are already making a difference. So, The reason why I believe the Eagles will be better this year is because the defense will be better. And I think when your defense, which was so bad last year, I mean, people forget how many games they allowed 30 plus points last year. Seven games. They allowed 30 plus points. Now, you might not remember that because they won three of those games. <laughs> Two of them against Washington. But we all remember it's not like Washington was a great football team last year. And you allowed 31 points twice to them. And the other game that you beat a team by allowing 30 points was the Buffalo Bills in overtime in the rain at home. And I was there and I remember the energy in that crowd. You could argue that those players started feeding off the energy in the crowd. I've never seen Jalen Hurts that emotional after a win before in my life. So, you look over last season and you realize that even as far back as week two, when they allowed 28 points to the Vikings, you found out very quickly that this defense 
was not ready for prime time. So you guys let me know. How are you feeling about the Eagles this year? Is Vic Fangio enough of an upgrade for you to believe in this defense again? 609-403-0973 is the text board. Your DMs into the 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. And if you want to go win tickets to go see Andrew Scholl's Saturday, August 24th, the 10.30 p.m. show at Ovation Hall inside Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City. Text Ocean along with your thoughts on the Eagles at 609-403-0973. Also, leave your name as well so I can give you credit for it. Uh, Jeff from Ocean City chimes in and says, I'm starting with a division title for the Eagles, and I'm, we're going to go from there. I think there's still a lot of questions, but I think this is an 11 and 16. Well, my question for Jeff from Ocean City is they were 11 and 6 last year as well. So it sounds like to me, and I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, Jeff from Ocean City, so please text back and let me know. It sounds like to me that you have questions that were not answered by the changes of coordinator. It sounds like to me that if you're saying they're an 11 and 16 this year and they were also an 11 and 16 last year, to me, that sounds like that you are saying that they are going to lose the same number of games as last year. If they're winning the same number of games as last year, does that mean they're not better than last year? Because if I'm the project this schedule, right? Where would I find six losses on the schedule this year? Probably at Cincinnati and at Baltimore. Well, that's two already right there. Do you, do you lose the game at Dallas? Do you lose the game at the Rams? I'm mostly looking at road games for losses here. Do they lose again in Tampa? They won the regular season last year, but they lost in the postseason. Are you losing the game at home versus Cleveland or Jacksonville? Are you losing the home game against the Steelers? Because I'm running out of places to find six losses, Jeff from Motion City. So I need a little more explanation from you. A little more from Jeff from Motion City. Text board 609-403-0973. An anonymous texture chimed in and says, the Birds going to the Super Bowl. They're going to go 13-4. and four. They're going to beat the 49ers in a shootout. We will split the season games with Dallas, and we'll lose one to New York or Washington along the way. We will lose to the Ravens and the Rams. Okay, time out, time out. So you're saying losses to the Ravens and the Rams, one loss to Dallas, and one more random NFC East loss. I would assume it's Washington. I think New York's going to be really bad this year. I think their offense with that Saquon is going to look worse than people realize. I think Washington is probably going to surprise people. I know that we're, we haven't done like win totals for like the NFC East yet, but I would be surprised if Washington gets the over on the, the win total in part because they've cleaned out a lot of the toxic nature of that organization from years past. I think Dan Quinn's going to breathe a, a new new fresh air in that organization. San Francisco's got a lot of problems to figure out. They don't know what they're doing with Brandon Ayuk. They don't know what they're doing um, with Trent Williams. Those are two guys that got to be figured out and signed at some point. And then Christian McCaffrey is injured in training camp. It's a calf injury. And anytime you got a soft tissue injury, I worry. I'm concerned. So I don't think San Francisco is going to be as much of a monster, much of a powerhouse as they've been in years past. 13 and 4, though. All right. That's one prediction for the upcoming season. 609 403 0973. Another anonymous texter. We'll call him uh, Mr. 943. Mr. 943 says, New defensive coordinator will stabilize the defense and do enough to hold teams, and the offense will be able to outscore them. Couldn't stop the bleeding last year. It sounds like this year's Phillies. <laughs> wow. I mean, you just had to sling the mud back on the Phillies. We've been talking about football for about 18 minutes, but you had to throw the Phillies back under the bus when you had the chance. <laughs> 
Wow. What a text. David and Violin chimes in at 609-403-0973. I think the, this season the Eagles will develop a new identity. Dave from Violin says the players will buy into the new veteran leadership with their skills. An obvious improvement on defense will lead to a 12-13 win season in the division. Title, my expectations for this season are to win an NFC championship and for us to know what we're in for the next few years. Can I hit on the last part really quick? David Violin says, we're going to know what we're in for for the next few years. That is a fabulous point by David and Violin. The rest of it is subjective, right? It's opinion-based. But that's a more objective take by David and Violin in the last part. Jalen Carter, Jordan Davis, Nolan Smith, Quinion Mitchell, Cooper DeGene, Reed Blankenship, Keely Ringo. These are all guys on the defense. Bryce Huff. These are all guys on the defense side of the ball who are mid to early 20s. They all are going to have roles in some capacity this year. Do all of them step up? Can the Kobe Dean fulfill the hope and the promise that came with him coming out of college? You know, Keely Ringo is a five-star recruit. But he's also one of the youngest guys in this roster. How does his maturity develop? Can Quinion Mitchell take playing time away from other guys on this team? Is Reed Blankenship going to be able to step up and grow into a role next to C.J. Garner-Johnson? Can Nolan Smith be the pass rusher that we all hoped he can be? Is Bryce Huff going to be worth the money and letting go of Hassan Reddick? It's a great point by David and Violin. Because what he's, David and Violin is saying is basically, look, man, you look at this Eagles team, we're going to learn a lot about this team this year. And we're going to know exactly what kind of team we can expect to have for the next few years. Because even if the Eagles go 12-5 and five this year, right, to, to use David and Violin's point of 12-13 wins, they can go 12-5, and five, which is only a one-win improvement over last year. But you can feel a lot better about this team at the end and say, you know what? They didn't win a championship. But, man, that defense looks way better than it did before. That offense looks way better than it did before. I mean, what if you lose in the NFC Championship game 30-27 on a last-second field goal? You're not going to have the same bad vibes that you had coming out of 2023. You are not going to have the same dark cloud hanging over your head for six, seven months. I mean, it was to a point where I was wearing an Eagles shirt a few months ago during the offseason. Somebody told me to cover up the Eagles symbol because they still had not emotionally recovered from the Eagles season. So David and Violin is 100% right. We are going to learn this year exactly what kind of team we are going to be for years to come. All right, more of your texts coming up, 609-403-0973. We're all sticking qualifiers. If you want tickets to go see Andrew Scholes perform at Ocean Casino's Ovation Hall on Saturday, August 24th, text Ocean with your thoughts, your expectations for the Eagles season this year. More of your texts coming up on the other side, 609-403-0973. Again, you can qualify for a pair of tickets to go see Andrew Scholes in Atlantic City at Ovation Hall, the 1030 show. We only have a handful of these tickets left. Ocean Casino Resort, always hooking us up here on 97.3 ESPN, saying, you know what, 97.3? If your audience wants to go see Andrew Schultz, we're going to put away, we're going to put aside a couple of these pair of tickets because we're almost sold out. It's 1030 show. It's one of the hottest tickets in town. And you can go see him. All you got to do to qualify is text OCEAN and your thoughts 
on the Eagles this year. 609-403-0973. More of your messages coming up next. I'm Josh Hennig, filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. It's If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it. Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Mike Gill. And I am the voice of the voiceless. On 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Three o'clock hour of the Sports Batch here on 97.3 ESPN. Being brought to you by Brawley's Plumbing and Heating and Air Conditioning. Brawley's is your trusted source for air conditioning and heating service and installation, along with plumbing, maintenance, and service for generations. Call them at 609-390-3907 or visit them online at Brawley's.net. As promised, back to the text board at 609-403-0973. We'll dig deeper on the Eagles with Jeff Mosher on Football at 4 coming up in less than 30 minutes from now. But we've been asking you guys, if you want to qualify for tickets to go see Andrew Scholes perform at Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City, Saturday, August 24th inside of Ovation Hall, there's a select number of tickets left. For the 1030 show. This is almost completely sold out. So if you want to get a pair of tickets, you qualify by texting Ocean and your thoughts on the Eagles right now to 609-403-0973. So let's read your text now. Chris from Millville chimes in and says, The upgrades in the coaching and the secondary players is good, but the linebackers and pass rush is still questionable. Chris and Miller, I think it's kind of back to what David and Violin was saying. The idea that we're going to find out who this team is this year. Because N'Kobe Dean, linebacker. Zach Bond, linebacker. Devin White, linebacker. Those are all three guys who have a lot to prove this year to show that the Eagles did enough to address the linebacker issue. Jeremiah Trotter Jr., he's a rookie. What will he play this year? I mean, we have heard... Different people who cover the Eagles say they expect Jeremiah Trotter Jr. to get playing time this year. You mentioned the pass rush. This is the question about Hassan Reddick. You take Hassan Reddick off the field for this team. Two productive years. Hassan Reddick has had double-digit sacks four straight years for four different defensive coordinators. The Eagles said, we're not going to give him a contract extension. We're going to give some of that money that would have gone to Hassan Reddick and give it to Bryce Huff. Is Bryce Huff a good enough pass rusher to offset the loss of Hassan Reddick? Can Josh Sweat take that next step as a pass rusher? Will Jalen Carter do more than six sacks that he had last year? Yeah, everybody loves this guy. Lane Johnson, Jordan Maialata, Brandon Graham, all think very highly of Jalen Carter. Lane Johnson on the offense side of the ball, as well as Jordan Maialata, these guys think this guy's a stud. Well, he's got to play like it. Because guess what? If Jalen Carter is anywhere close to his potential this year, it makes the pass rush for the Eagles and the entire defense way better. He may be the most important player on this team. And Lane Johnson thinks that Jalen Carter has the chance to be the best player on this team. Well, if Jalen Carter's the best player on this team, I think that fixes your pass rush problem. <laughs> Okay, because if he's blowing up the offensive lines week in and week out, that's going to make everyone else's job getting to the quarterback a lot easier. Uh, Bobby chimes in on the text board at 609-403-0973. says the Eagles will be better simply because... Um, he says simply because of the coaches. Okay, that's fine. Not the biggest explanation in the world, but thank you, Bobby, for chiming in on the text board. Uh, Tim and Marmora at 609-403-0973 says, obviously the Eagles will be better. It's impossible for them to be worse. <laughs> Tim and Marmora. That's the spirit, Tim. Yep, that's the spirit, Tim. Just turn around and be like, well, we can't be worse. <laughs> 
which, I, listen, he's not wrong, okay? The defense was among the worst in the league last year statistically. I told you guys, they were third worst in points allowed. They were the second worst pass defense in the entire NFL. And they were bottom 10 in the NFL in, in turnovers four. So in the most literal sense, Tim Amar Mora is right. Uh, Jeff from Ocean State chimes in and says, defense still my biggest question. Uh, I still have some Hurts questions. Also, can Saquon Barkley be healthy? He says, here are my six losses for the Eagles. So he has the Eagles losing to the Packers on Friday night to open the season. Then he has them losing at Cincinnati, at Dallas, at the Rams, at Baltimore, and home against Pittsburgh. Well, a couple things there, Jeff. I extremely disagree with you on the Pittsburgh one. I think they're winning that game. I think by that point in the year, the Eagles will have an identity and Pittsburgh, they'll be sputtering. I think Pittsburgh is in a lot of trouble this year because their wide receiver position, they overhauled it and there's no guarantee they overhauled it enough. They brought in an offensive coordinator who is a run first, pass second coordinator on a team that does not have as good of offensive lines they've had in years past, has questions of who the real lead running back is on that team. And... Is it Russell Wilson or Justin Fields playing quarterback at that point? The other games I, I can see. I, I can see you chalking them up as losses. On the text board, 609-403-0973. Um, Steven chimes in on the text board and says, the Eagles are going to be worse record-wise this year. They won their Super Bowl but they're not due for another 10 years. Also, the coaching is bad. They got a lot of talent, but it won't work out. I see this team like Tampa Bay Bucks with Brady, except the Eagles have Jalen Hurts and worse coaching. All right, Stephen, a couple things. Number one, you're obviously an Eagles hater. Second of all, you didn't follow the instructions for the contest. I gave the instructions multiple times. You didn't follow. So... Steven's out of the running, not because of your prediction, but because your perspective is incredibly skewed. You must hate the Eagles. First of all, saying a team is not due for 10 years to win a championship is silly because football is the fastest turnaround sport of all time. We have seen teams go from worst to first every single year in the NFL for the last 30 years. I don't think anyone would have predicted the Eagles were winning in 2017 before they won it that year. I don't think anybody was predicting that, you know, the year the Saints won the Super Bowl, what was that, 15 years ago, that they were going to win it that year. Or the year the Ravens won with Joe Flacco before the year they're going to win it that year. So you're, you already have a flawed philosophy. You said the coaching is bad. So you're saying that Vic Fangio has been coaching in the NFL longer than some people are listening to my voice have been alive? He's a bad coach? Kellen Moore, when he was in Dallas, three of his four years, had a top 10 in almost every offensive category. And the one year he didn't, Dak Prescott was injured. He had John Kitna, right? So you're telling me that Kellen Moore and Vic Fangio are bad coaches. Flawed take. I think that Steven did a bad job there. He did a bad job following assignment. The teacher's got to give you a D, man. That's a D minus. It's not a full fail. You put your name on it. You know, it's like when you took the SAT, you got credit for putting your name on the test. That's what Steven just got. <laughs> Come on, man. You can't say the coaching is bad. It's the worst coaching. I mean, you, you, you sound like a tool. Come on, man. No bueno. But you all can't say I didn't read his text. 609-403-0970. Pat chimes in and says, my biggest concern for the defense, where is the pass rush coming from? What if Bryce Huff isn't as good as we hope? I think we're going to miss Hassan Reddick a lot. That's from Pat. Pat, you're kind of in line with my question. The Huff replacing Hassan Reddick may be the bigger question of all because if the coordinator is better, which Vic Fangio obviously is, and you invested a ton of resources into the secondary, which the Eagles have, 
both of those don't matter if the Huff replacing Reddick gamble, we'll call it, doesn't work out. The good job there by Pat. Pat following the instructions of the conversation. James from Atlantic City chimes in at 609-403-0973. James says, Do you think the Eagles season would be a failure if they don't have a good season in a playoff run? James, I do think it's a failure. This is an organization that should make the postseason every year. Even when they fell apart last year, they were still in the playoffs. If they don't make a playoff run this year, that means they're not better than last year. They failed to upgrade enough. Everything that we were told was a forgazy. In order for the Eagles to not have a playoff run, that means that Vic Fangio is all talk. Kellen Moore is a mirage. Nick Sirianni and Harry Roseman are liars. Lane Johnson is an idiot. Jordan Maialata is an idiot. Chris Long is an idiot. In order for what you just said to happen, James, it would be a massive failure because that means everyone was either lying to us where everyone is a fool. So it would be a massive failure if they don't make a playoff run. They have to fire Nick Sirianni. They have to borderline blow it all up. David and Violent follows up on his text at 609-403-0973. He says, I got to admit, though, David and Violent says, I do think they will be bad at the start of the year. They will lose to Tampa or New Orleans or one of those teams, and people are going to freak out. I think this team will click as the year progresses and they learn who they are. That's from David and Violent. See, I tend to agree with that. I think that they are going to lose something early in the year, whether it is I don't, I mean, it might be the Tampa game because the bye week is right after that. But you're right. At Tampa, at New Orleans, back to back weeks, they lost that game with the Jets last year. They shouldn't have lost. And teams lose games like that every year. There's always a game or two in everyone's schedule where they lose it and you're like scratching your head. It's like the meme of the guy scratching his head, wondering what's going on. That's the Eagles. There's a, there's a game every year for every NFL team, even playoff teams, where you're looking at them and you're like, how did they lose this game? It, it kind of reminds me, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs, everyone agrees. At least hope everyone agrees. Maybe that one text for Steven doesn't agree because he seems to hate everybody. But most people with common sense would agree that every year NFL teams have a loss that you're looking around like, how did that even happen? And I remember when the Chiefs last year lost to the Denver Broncos. I can't remember what week it was. But I remember it was in Denver, and they got smashed. And Travis Kelsey got so mad that his brother asked him about it, they stormed off their podcast that episode. And the whole season, we were looking at the Chiefs like, look, I I get you losing to some of these teams, but how did you lose at Denver in such an embarrassing way? And every year, teams lose like that. There's always a game on the schedule that you look around and be like, how the heck did they lose that game? And everyone kind of overreacts to it. And that was Kansas City last year. That loss was completely and utterly embarrassing. But you know what? They bounced back and they had a good year in the one Super Bowl. So it didn't matter. It's a good point there by David and Violin. Uh, 609-403-0973 is the text board. Uh, Steven Ventner chimes in and says, I think the Eagles are going to try to get their pass rush up the middle more this year with Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter. You will see an uptick in sacks from the linebackers as well because this defense will be better. I think there'll be a 12 and 16. Maybe, sorry, 12 and 5, maybe 11 and 6. That's from Steven Bender. So Steve thinks they will be better this year. I think you're right. I think that it's interesting. Well, let me ask you guys a question. If Jalen Carter and Jordan Davis have a big year, does that help the linebacker blitz or the edge blitz more? Like if Jalen Carter has a has a great year and he's creating a lot of pressure up the middle, does that help the edge rushers or the linebacker rush more? Let's squeeze in one more text before we hit the break at 609-403-0973. Shane or an EHT 
chimes in. He says, the Eagles have cap room. Let's bring Hassan Reddick back. Tim is right. We can't have ended worse than last year. I would love to see some commitment to replacing Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham. Even though Brandon Graham will have limited snaps this year. He says, I think the Eagles get 11 or 12 wins is my hope and they win the division. 8 to 10 wins though wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Shader to HT. Shader, I got a lot to unpack there. First of all, um, I'm not a, a certified uh, clin- clinical psychologist, but just to evaluate what you're saying, I feel like what you're saying is, is that you don't think that Jalen Carter has proven yet that he can replace Fletcher Cox. And that wasn't enough of a commitment to draft guys like Carter and Davis. By the way, uh, Vic Fangio loves Milton Williams. Well, we got to throw that out there as well. So it sounds like Chandler and EHT, you don't think you've seen enough from those guys to say those guys are replacing Fletcher. The Brandon Graham thing is interesting because, like I said, them losing Reddick and replacing him with Huff. We're going to find out a lot about this year. Can if, if Nolan Smith has a good year, is that enough to say Nolan Smith can replace Brandon Graham? It's a very interesting take from Shaner and EHT. Because Shaner is basically saying, I have not seen enough here to say that what I have been given is good enough. All right, more text to get to on the text board. Paul from Hoboth Beach, Beach, your text and more coming up here on the Sports Bash. Josh Henning filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it. Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Philly's lineup is now it's being brought to you by Clark's Moving and Storage. Moving is a breeze with parts moving in storage, and I hate this lineup. See, it's moments like this where someone like me is reminded why baseball is not my favorite sport. See, stupid stuff like this doesn't happen in football. You don't wake up one day and decide, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just throw a random group of guys on the field because... Yeah. I mean, this is a borderline vomit-worthy lineup. And I'm sorry that Clark's Moving and Storage has to have their name attached to this lineup today. Schwerber with Castellanos behind him in the in the two-hole. I mean, in what reality should Castellanos ever be batting between Schwerber and Harper? Following Harper is Boehm as usual. Stott is still in the five spot, which Rob Thompson's explanation last night just kind of made me roll my eyes because basically Rob Thompson thinks that Bryson Stott has been hitting the ball better even though he's not getting base hits. Behind Stott is Real Muto. Sosa's in the lineup for Trey Turner. No Trey Turner tonight. But Brandon Marsh is in the lineup in left field with Rojas in center. So, you can bench Turner, but you don't bench Marsh. To me, you should have benched both Marsh and Turner if that's the reasoning. Because if Turner needs a day off, Marsh definitely needs a day off. And if anybody should be in the two spot, it should be Romuto or Sosa. Not Castellanos. This is one of the worst lives I've ever seen this year. This is why I'm reminded why baseball is so exhausting. There's never a day where a football coach wakes up and says, well, you know, my my wide receivers aren't playing well. So I'm going to keep the wide receiver in the lineup who can't catch the ball. But I'm going to put a random wide receiver in there in place of the guy 
who is catching the ball, who has ever played before. Like, he just, ira- it's not a, good, not a good analogy. But the point is that it's only in baseball that people make these moves and we are supposed to accept it as they're the professionals, they're the experts. More football talk coming in next. Jeff Motion from the Inside the Birds podcast joins us for football at four next on 97.3 ESPN. 97.3 ESPN presents the Sports Bash with Mike Gill. It's time for Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Just hungry to bring back another Lombardi to Philly. Uh, it's, uh, the fans deserve it. Our team deserves it. Uh, culture begs for it. Now live, this is Football at Four. Football at Four, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. InsideTheBirds.com and search Inside the Birds on YouTube. And it's being brought to you. By the Gallery Bar Booking Games inside Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City. Go to the Gallery. Go to Ocean. Go for the win this football season. For more information, visit OceanAC.com. And it's a Wednesday, and that means it's time for Jeff Mosher to join the conversation here on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, welcome back. How are you doing on this Wednesday? I am great, Josh. And now I think I'm good. As we discussed, I'm going to be headed to the, I am headed to the Phillies game. So as I told you, it's somewhat like, you know, is that like uh, getting ready for your own funeral these days? I mean, I'm <laughs> hoping to have a good time tonight, but uh, I, I'm not sure whether to be in the camp of just booing every, everyone, every single one of them, or giving that standing ovation Trey Turner style and hope that that is the remedy for the entire team. Well, considering how horrible the lineup looks tonight, I I think you have a better chance of booing than anything else. <laughs> Probably, but you know what? I at least applaud a lineup switch or a change. <laughs> so, Jeff, let's talk to you about something that's not as depressing, which is the Eagles. And before we get into the particulars from the joint practice and them t- the team preparing for the next preseason game, I want to ask you about the question I asked in the last hour, which is, you know, we have been told multiple places, right? Brandon Graham has talked about it. Lane Johnson has talked about it. You guys talked about it on the Inside the Birds podcast. The Eagles, you know, know, subconsciously admitted it. The problem last year was the coaching. So if this team had the third worst in the NFL in points allowed per game, and they were second worst in pass defense, and they were bottom 10 in turnovers forced on defense, is it fair to say that Vic Fangio may be the biggest upgrade of the offseason for this team? Um, I'm a big believer that, you know, in the NFL, coaching is, is probably more important than, say, baseball or the NBA, right, where talent reigns supreme. Uh, clearly, when you have coaches, you have to call every single play um, and are probably more involved in player development than a baseball manager or an NBA coach. Then, yeah, I, I, I see the addition of Vic Fangio, and not just that, but the fact that most of his position coaches – are just are have worked for him before so you don't have that confusion from last year you don't have like two different hybrid defenses you don't have a guy trying to run a template of a Fangio defense you actually have Vic Fangio and his coaches I do believe that that makes a huge difference but Josh at the end of the day the the improvement of the Eagles defense will have to be because of the improvement of the talent in the secondary more so than the coaching staff and I say that because as highly regarded as Vic Fangio is, I, I think if you look at his career as a play caller from Chicago to San Francisco to, to Texans to Carolina, all that, um, he's had as many bottom 10 defenses as top 10 defenses. And I'm not trying to disparage him for that. What I'm just simply saying is when he's had good talent, he's obviously been able to maximize it. But when he's had bad talent, the idea of Vic Fangio just being the guy there didn't, didn't matter at that point. So I do think the talent – Overall, especially in the secondary, um, is going to have to be the difference for the Eagles this year than last year. Okay, so if we look at the secondary, so what do we do about a team that drafts a guy in the first round, but then is giving him so many reps at nickel? And Fangio has said nickel and corner are not the same, okay? So if you draft a guy to be a cornerback, 
but then as a rookie, you're putting him in nickel. Is that out of necessity or is Quinion Mitchell just that talented? Well, I, I talked about this with Mike last week. I, I was sort of trying to get a bigger picture outlook of why this was going on. And, and I think Vic Frangio confirmed what I had said last week in his press conference. It, for him right now, it's about fielding the best secondary possible. Um, and Quinion Mitchell playing nickelback, as long as he's doing it well, which so far he seems to be doing, then enables Vic Fangio to play Isaiah Rogers outside. And, you know, Rogers runs a 4-2. He's dynamic. He's athletic. I mean, it certainly comes with a little bit of peril when you're only 5'9 and you're playing outside corner. Um, but the alternative for Vic, and this is all while Cooper DeGene was sidelined, right, Josh, is that he plays Quinion Mitchell at his natural outside position opposite Slay and then needs to find someone to play nickel back. And it's not going to be Rodgers because he did not play inside nickel in Indianapolis and he hasn't practiced there yet. Right. Not going to be Ringo. He's never played there. So then you're going back down the Avante Maddox slash Tyler Hall route, right? And that, that just, to me, you go back to last year's defense and you were slow, you were not dynamic, you were basic, you just didn't have great athletes. So enabling yourself to play Rodgers on the outside and Quinion Mitchell on the inside, opposite slay, gives you more athleticism and more dynamic ability in your, your starting cornerback group than the alternative. So, But now the question is, once with Cooper DeGene now back, and once he's two to three to four weeks in, maybe get, he, he wants to play in this preseason game, coming uh, the third one, not, not t- tomorrow's. Once he gets into this thing, once he starts to round the form, if he can effectively play the nickel, will we then see Quinion Mitchell move to the outside to play where he was originally drafted? Because then you're not losing at anything out of, as far as athleticism or dyna- dynamite ability because Cooper DeGene is a dynamic athlete as well. You mentioned DeGene. I want to ask you about that because there was speculation from the draft that he could be potentially a guy who might have to move to safety in the NFL. But DeGene has said multiple times that he has only gotten work at corner and at nickel. So do you think the fact that he's only gotten work at those two positions is a clear enough sign of what his role would be on this defense? Uh, uh, it's tough to say, Josh, um, only because, like, nobody would have thought Quinion Mitchell was going to work at nickel going into camp, and that seemed to be a decision that the coaching staff made, again, to get the best combination and see if he could handle it. So I don't want to – Well, I, 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 so I imagine that right now Cooper DeGene is working at the spots that he's played before in college, right? He's played right. corner. I believe he's played some nickel at Iowa, and so you're not trying to put – too much on this plate. But you're, so for the spirit of your question, the Eagles are still really thin at safety, right? So let's say like by week three or week four, the Eagles really like how Cooper DeGene has progressed and they're ready to like, you know, play him in a real actual game, you know, regular season game. But let's say that Quinton Mitchell is doing really well at nickel and Isaiah Rogers is playing at a high level at outside. Do they then start to experiment with Cooper DeGene at safety because that would, again, give them the best combination that they can get to put out there in the secondary? Maybe. So I don't want to slam the door on that because, obviously, Cooper DeGene came out of the draft and some teams looked at him and thought, hey, he, he probably might be a better safety or a nickel than, say, uh, an outside corner nickel. So I don't want – what we're seeing now is, I think, what is best for the team and what we're seeing four or five weeks – from now might be different. Talking with Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast, insidethebirds.com, at Jeff P. Mosher over on the Twitter X platform here on Football for Josh Eddie filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. The reason I'm asking some of these questions, Jeff, is because, you know, Avante Maddox. It's August? Because it's August? Well, aside have- from that. <laughs> Just kidding, God. No, it's because of Avante Maddox, because he had been yeah. the presumptuous nickel guy for years now, right? And he hasn't mm-hmm. been able to stay healthy. And But now in training camp this year, Fangio is giving him more and more work at safety in these practices, and which is opening the door for guys like Mitchell to get more reps at the nickel. So 
does it make sense to you for the Eagles to enter the year with Avante Maddox at safety instead of nickel? I, I don't know. Um, and and I, I say that not to be elusive with the question or evade it, but Andrew DeCecco, um will be on the podcast, the Inside the Birth podcast with me tomorrow. We've already um, recorded it. And he had some interesting observations about Avante Maddox, specifically the level of play that, that he thinks Avante's playing at right now um, in any position. Uh, and, you know, just to, without making it a total tease, you know, he, he's just concerned. And, and there's been a lot of injuries, as you mentioned, right? There's been a lot of um, – now there's position switching. Uh, he's a little bit older. Remember, this guy only signed a one-year deal. He went out there. He didn't really find – a whole lot. So I'm not exactly sure that we definitely pencil Avante Maddox in on the team. I mean, I get that they're thin at safety, um, but now that Cooper DeGene's back, if you want to maybe if the team wants to count him as a future potential safety or an interior type defender that you have alongside CJ Gardner Johnson. And remember, Sidney Brown's going to come back, I'm sure, pretty soon, right? Um, and then you've got Reed Blankenship, like, I, I just, I can't say for sure, Josh, that Avante Maddox is definitely making the team to be able to say that he fits better at one position or the other because, you know, we've seen people's expiration dates come and, and his might have reached here if, if things don't change a little bit for him in camp. Speaking of guys in their roles, let's talk about the ILBs, the inside linebackers. You know, do at the very start of the training camp, we were seeing a lot of... Devin White, Zach Bond is the primary tandem. Now, as the weeks have gone on, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is getting more work. N'Kobe Dean is getting more work. Jeff, you mentioned on Monday on Football at Four that you wouldn't be surprised if, you know, by halfway through the end of the year, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. is one of the main guys at the inside linebacker. I mean, are we trending in a way that the Eagles are almost like, you know, letting letting the guys, you know, prove their own worth, it seems like, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it would be it would be hard to keep him, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., off the field if he's playing this well. But this is where we all have to stop and say, remember that Mr.'s training camp and what you see in training camp doesn't always translate immediately. Sometimes it doesn't translate at all to, to regular season games. Uh, so it, it, it appears that you've got Devin White, N'Kobe Dean, and Zach Bond still sort of duking it out here to be your, your top two linebackers in your nickel. Now, that doesn't mean Trotter won't carve out some kind of role, certainly special teams, but even on defense. You can go situational. You can have different kind of packages for different down and distances that you might feel more comfortable with Trotter in. But the big question, Josh, is really, and I think, you know, today's, uh, I'm sorry, yesterday's practice in uh, Foxborough may have started to supply a little bit of an answer to that because yesterday's practice, N'Kobe Dean ran with Devin White first team, um, at least more than he had normally. It had been White and Bond. You heard Vic Fangio say, hey, Bond did all right in the preseason game, but right. he's out of place a few times. So, I'm wondering if the first major move at this position, uh, and it's a move that Adam and I have kind of forecasted. We thought this might eventually happen, although it hasn't happened yet. Really, we got we got to see more of what goes on. Is Nicole Dean getting back to being a starting inside linebacker? Yeah, I mean that's the thing with the Kobe Dean is that you know he was a guy that came with so much promise coming out of college, Jeff. And you know we had a listener make this comment a little bit earlier. He, they asked about you know. Could we be seeing what the future is going to look like for Philadelphia? Because you drafted all these guys from Georgia. Dean, Smith, Davis, Carter, Ringo. At some point, Jeff, some of these guys got to show up and start doing something to pay off all this investment. It's a, no doubt about it. Huge year for all three of them. Well, I wouldn't say huge year for Jalen Carter. I think he's he's... Of the three, the less under the microscope. Obviously, he has to do better than last year as the year goes on. But, I mean, you saw his level of play when he played well, and it was pretty darn impressive. Jordan Davis is the guy that's got to prove that he can play at a really high level from top to bottom all year long and then eventually maybe even you know become a little bit of a pocket pusher. And then, of course, Nicobe staying healthy and, and taking over a starting role, being more than just a special teamer. Yeah, 
absolutely critical for the for that. And then I guess to your point, it's a little bit of a referendum on we'll call it the process, the Georgia process, like the Sixers process, right? Right. Like just getting all the Georgia guys. You know, Ringo is part of that too. Um, does that was that the correct narrative at the end of the day that if you just draft guys from this national championship defense, you're naturally going to you know automatically be a much better defense yourself? Well, that was always the question with Alabama. People wanted people to draft people from Alabama for years because they were winning championships and it's Nick Saban. So it's, it's kind of yeah. the same deal with this. It's like, well, if you draft all these guys, then what happens is the question. Um, speaking of the joint practice, Jeff, what do you say to the people? And I, I've seen these comments the last 24 hours. Well, it's the Patriots. You're not playing the Patriots in the regular season. Like, what do you say to the people who are looking at the joint practice and poo-pooing it? Well, I don't know why you poo poo any joint practice because it's always good to see a different offense and a different defense. I mean, it's it's just practice. So, I mean, like, there's there's really nothing to poo poo about it. But at the same time, nothing to really I, – I, I suppose in a, when you're playing the Patriots, you're just sort of talent deficient in a lot of the areas. There's also nothing to go gaga about because a guy catches a touchdown or a guy gets a sack, you know, a quote-unquote sack, two-handed touch sack. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're just trying to get better by facing a different team, a different scheme, different personnel than than the people you see every single day. I think that matters for a guy like Zach Bond, who, you know, you're looking to see if he understands the intricacies of playing inside linebacker. Well, it's a little bit easier for Zach to do that when every single day he's facing the same offense, you know, Eagles offense, and he kind of understands certain tendencies there. Now if you throw, just like the preseason game in Baltimore, now you throw a different team out there who may draw the red circle around him and try to confuse him with certain formations or things that they do. Does that work? Call more for Jeff Mosher from the Inside the Birds podcast, insidethebirds.com, and at Jeff P. Mosher on the Twitter X platform. Jeff, I want to flip it to the offense. I want to ask you uh, a version of the question I asked Adam yesterday because, you know, we were talking yesterday about, you know, the importance of the number two tight end, the number three wide receiver. You know, we know Howie Roseman is famous or infamous, depending on who you ask, for making moves for the season and even in season to make additions to this team. If Howie's going to make that move, Jeff, is it more likely to be the number three wide receiver or the number two tight end? Um, probably. Oh, I would say the number three wide receiver, no doubt. Um, only because, you know, I know Grant Calcaterra is out with a shoulder uh, issue right now. And may- maybe if that's worse than, than we think and he's going to be out a really long time, then maybe he might feel like he has to make a move. But he still has CJ Uzama. And, I, I, you know, CJ Uzama's a veteran. He may not have left in the, a lot left in the tank, but he can still block. And that's really a, a key role for their, their wide tight end, their number two tight end that Jack Stoll was able to do the last few years, block and catch a little. Um, so they can kind of get away with Uzama and then maybe a Alberto or a, a Jake, EJ Jenkins. But, you know, the number three, it's hard to hide your number three wide receiver when you're an 11 personnel based offense. So, so if they're not, loving what they're seeing and even if they are loving what they're seeing but skeptical that a guy like Britton Covey or a guy like Johnny Wilson can really hold up as uh in that spot then I would see them making a move there yeah I'm just I'm I'm just trying to decipher it because first of all you mentioned Calcaterra's got a shoulder Calcaterra always has something Jeff the guy is constantly getting injured and Adam brought up yesterday about how CJ Uzam has been pretty disappointing at times Mm -hmm. in this training camp and these practices. And I'm sorry, but I'm not getting excited about EJ Jenkins or Albert O at all. And I mean, listen, I understand that Kellen Moore is a history of doing very well with tight ends, but I mean, I gotta be honest, Jeff, no Eagle fan is going to get, you be like, let me tell you who we're looking forward to seeing catch touchdowns, EJ Jenkins this year. You know what I mean? So like, and we, and Dallas Goddard himself has been injured over the years. So that's why I'm wondering, in an offense with Kellen Moore where his tight ends average eight touchdowns, almost eight touchdowns per year, it's like 7.78 is the actual average, but when they average almost eight touchdowns per year, but under Sirianni and Syke they average four touchdowns per year, 
We know that Kellen Moore is going to use these guys. And I'm just trying to decipher as I look at this team and how not the initial 53 man looks, but how the final 53 man looks, how much of an investment, how he might have to make in improving the tight end before the season. Yeah, and it wouldn't shock me if, uh, listen, especially around cut down, veteran cut down, you find a veteran tight end out there who's got a little blah. I mean, they have it already in Uzama, but if they wanted to have just another one uh, to have on the practice squad, that's fine. But at the end of the day, when you're talking about a starting position versus a backup position, right, I view the slot receiver as a starting position because the Eagles are going to be in 11 personnel, three wide, one tight end, uh, almost. 65, 70% of the time, if they can, uh, if they, that's what they want to be. And all they would need in that regard, in that, in that scenario, is a healthy Dallas Cotter. And you're not necessarily worried about the number two tight end. But if Johnny Wilson or Britt Covey is your guy that you're asking to play 65 to 70% of the snaps in the game as a number three receiver, you're probably thinking to yourself, I'm not 100% sold on that. You know, you're talking about a rookie and, and a punt returner. Which leads me right into the number three receiver question. You know, Britton Covey looked pretty good in that preseason game. But I don't think anyone is going to pretend like Britton Covey is the next coming of, like, Wes Welker or anything. Uh, right. So, Paris Campbell finally not injured anymore. So, assuming he's in the mix, although he's been injured about like a zillion times himself, assuming he's in the mix... If the Eagles start the season with Paris Campbell as the number three wide receiver and Britton Covey as the four, is that good enough? Well, <laughs> yes and no, right? Is it good? Is it good enough? If Paris Campbell is healthy and stays healthy and can give you some slot reps, which he's done before. I mean, he's not a slot receiver, honestly, um, but he did play it. A couple of years ago with Indianapolis when, when they had really no choice. Uh, and he caught the most passes in his career. Now, he also had the lowest yards per catch in his career. But if it, at least he's a veteran guy who understands route trees, knows how to get open. So if he starts the season as your number three receiver and can play the slot, move out. See, he's important because he can move. He can play outside as long as he's healthy. Um, if you get an injury to, say, A.J. Brown or Devontae Smith. Well, let's say Paris Campbell just doesn't make it through camp and is not healthy. Then you're in trouble because neither Covey or Johnny Wilson, not only are they not most likely not equipped to be full-time slot receivers, not really equipped to be full-time outside wide receivers either. And if you had to miss Devontae Smith for two weeks or three weeks or A.J. Brown for two or three weeks, you'd be in a whole lot of trouble there. Jeff, before I let you go, Tomorrow night, Eagles preseason game number two. What is the player or the position you are going to be watching the closest? Oh, the offensive and defensive lines, Josh. Um, I'm fascinated. I don't know if everybody else is. I don't know how much you've talked about it or Mike's talked about it. I'm just so fascinated with Jeff Stoutland's affinity for Brett Toth um, that (laughs) now Brett Toth is the backup center and – he, you know, I guess if Cam Jurgens is out, then it's Brett, Tuff, not Matt Hennessy, you know. Right. Um, and yet they drafted a center in, in uh, Dylan McMahon, too. So usually you keep your draft pick. So if you're keeping Jurgens, Toth, and McMahon, right, um, doesn't seem to be a whole lot of room for Matt Hennessy unless you want to call him a guard. But if you're starting Makai Becton, right, then you're keeping Tyler Steen, and you've got this Darian Kennard who played all, every single snap. I've never seen this before in a preseason game. Guy played every single snap at right tackle. Thought he did all right. Came out well against the Ravens. So you got him. You got Fred Johnson. And, you know, guys who I thought had a good shot to make the team because they played a little bit in this league. Or they, uh, you know, Hennessy being um, a guy who came over from Atlanta, Temple kid. He, now all of a sudden you're thinking, where, where, where does he fit? Where's Matt Sharping, who's, who started playoff games, I believe, for the Bengals? Where, where's he fit? Where does Nick Gates fit? I mean, this guy has played center and guard in the NFL for a few years and played at a high enough level that the Redskins, I'm sorry, the commanders gave him a fairly decent contract a year or two ago. He's just been hurt. So I'm just looking at this whole offensive line 
um, trying to figure it all out. I forgot to mention Trevor Keegan. He's another left guard. He, he's only played left guard. So I just, like, where's Matt Hennessy showing up here? And then on the defensive line, we know about the starting three interior defensive linemen. Moro Ojomo looks like he's the number four. Marlon Tui Peloto has played well as a five, but really not too many veterans, no veterans there in the backup ranks. You got Thomas Booker trying to duke it out with, I guess, Gabe Hall um, for that, that last spot there. Uh, in the interior defensive line. So I want to see how well those guys do. He's Jeff Mosher at Jeff B. Mosher on Twitter X platform, Inside the Birds podcast. Like, subscribe, download wherever you get your podcasts. Also subscribe to the Inside the Birds YouTube channel. And don't forget about the Inside the Birds Patreon where you get all the exclusive content from Jeff Mosher, Adam Kaplan, and Andrew DiCecco. And Jeff joined us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, appreciate the time and uh, good luck with the Phillies game tonight. Thank you for wishing me luck. We will need it. Take care, guys. <laughs> Jeff Mosher joining us here on 97.3 ESPN. Of course, football at four is being brought to you by the Gallery Garbar Booking Games inside Ocean Casino Resort in Atlantic City. This football season, you want to go to the gallery. You want to go to Ocean. You want to go for the win because the gallery is the best place to watch football this season. For more information, visit OceanAC.com. And gambling problem, please call 1-800-GAMBLER. Coming up next, Nick Earnshaw is back for another edition of Nick's Nuggets. What will Nick Earnshaw be grinding his gears about today? Find out next here on the Sports Bash. Josh Hennig filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. We have the... If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat. Literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Traffic. You come with me. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Josh Hennig here filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN FM, the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. While I'm live in the Ocean Casino Resort Studios, Nick Earnshaw joins us live virtually here for Nick's Nuggets here on 97.3 ESPN. Nick, welcome back in. I know you have a uh, very busy uh, 36 hours. You got a concert tonight. You got orientation tomorrow at the community college. So I appreciate you still fitting in Nick's Nuggets among all the chaos. Oh, I have to fit it in no matter what, Josh. I mean, Nick Snug, it's a big part of my day. It's it's locked into the day, all right? I'm it's just, built into the schedule. I'm just acknowledging my appreciation <laughs> for you being here. That's all. Of course. Well, I'm happy to be here. I always enjoy doing Nick's Nuggets, but I'm a little upset. Not going to lie. I'm a little upset. I mean, we watched that Phillies game last night. I was blowing up your phone about 18 times, sending you a bunch of memes about the Phillies last night. I actually created my own. I posted it out. Uh, the one that I sent you with the clown faces <laughs> yes. and the Bryce, I created that myself. So I, I thought I did a pretty good job. You can go check that out at Energy Radio on, on X. That, that was that was a good one. You did, you did go with that. <laughs> yeah, that, that shows you how much time I really do have and how much time I am working, Josh. I mean, and that, I'm creating over here. And that, and that sometimes is a personal problem. <laughs> so, yeah, it's bad, man. We got to start with nugget, nugget number one. The Phillies are an abomination right now. Uh, they can't do anything right, it seems like. Um, so mm-hmm. I asked the question today during the update, uh, should the Phillies change up the lineup? And they did. And, and Rob Thompson went out there. He changed the lineup up. He shook things up a little bit. And he, they had to. They had to at this point. When you're when you're not in a, in a spot where you're experiencing success like they've had in the beginning of the season, now they just really haven't. You're gonna have to shake things up sometimes just to just to create a spark. And uh, the Phillies did that today, changing up the lineup. Trey Turner basically getting benched. He's getting the day off tonight. Uh, and Mundo Sosa gonna be playing shortstop for the Phillies. Castellanos. Josh is batting second. Um, I like the move of just switching things up just because nothing seems to be working right now. Um, you know, you have Schwarber, Castellanos, Harper, Bohmstadt, Romuto, Sosa, Marsh, and Rojas. I like taking Turner out of the lineup. 
Uh, maybe you give uh, maybe you give one of the other guys a day off to Harper here and there. Uh, Stott. I wouldn't mind that either, but it's a good start to shake things up. Move Castellanos, who's given you actually really good at bats lately, um, to this two hole tonight. Uh, I think it was a good job by Thompson to try and give this team a spark. So I aggressively disagree with this. Why? Why, Josh? See, this lineup change was like, we're making changes for the sake of making changes. For example, if you're going to bench Trey Turner for a game, then why is Brandon Marsh in a lineup? Like, if you're going to bench Turner, you have to bench Marsh. Marsh's batting, was it 080 in the last eight games? Like, who are you going to put out there? Weston Wilson? What sure. are you going to put Weston Wilson in the left field? At least he's hit a home run recently. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, I mean, that's, that's my first problem. Like, I felt like they were just like, they, um, they were playing roulette. It was like, all right, let's throw the dice and see who we're going to bench today. Oh, you got the, you got the, uh, the black. So you're going to be on the bench. You know, it just, it, the lineup feels so random of who they bench, who they didn't. Second of all, I hate Cassianos in the two hole and keeping Stott five. I don't care that Rob Thompson last night said Stott's having good at bats. Stott's not hitting. Put Castellanos, leave him at five. Boehm needs a legitimate guy behind him. If what you said about Castellanos, if you believe that, Nick Earnshaw, he needs to be behind Boehm more so than at the two hole. Okay, I, I understand. I, that's a great point. But Castellanos is giving you great at bats, and you can't go lefty, 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 then righty. I'm, not, do I'm not saying put Stott in the two hole. I don't want Stott behind. No, who put, would you put in the two hole then? If you're benching Turner for a game, who are you putting in the two hole? Sosa. Who? No, I'm not putting Sosa in the Why two not? hole. No, put Castellanos. He's giving you great at bats. No. Just shake it up a little bit. It's not. This isn't a permanent thing, Josh. This is like a one, two game type of thing. I'm I'm all cool for it. If you need to get a victory tonight, you're you've been sitting at 69 wins for a while now. You're almost at 70. You're falling back in the best record standings. Like. I just just change it up. Give your team a spark. Like if Schwarber could get on base, Castellanos giving you a good at bat, drive him in to start a game. I'm all for that. Here, here's my lineup. I would have done tonight. I would have gone okay, Schwarber, Sosa, Harper, Bohm, Castellanos. Then I would have gone Stott, Real Muto. Take Marsh on the lineup, put Weston Wilson in, leave Rojas in center. Which, by the way, how ridiculous was it last night? Rojas was on one of the only five hits last night, and he gets subbed out for a batter. Like, was yeah, that was ridiculous? It's like, not Marsh, not the guy who went over. No, poor Rojas, he gets no respect around here. He's one of only five hits last night, and like, yeah, we're going to pull you out of the lineup. Like, what? I believe he has a higher batting average than both Brandon Marsh and Bryson Stock. Only year. I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up, but I think you might be right. Only year, I think at this point in the season, with how things have gone, I think Rojas is ahead of them now in batting average, which is crazy to think about. Because, I mean, Rojas got sent down to AAA this year. Like, and people have complained about his bat and his approach at the plate. Rojas, he's actually been better than Stott and, and Marsh. So Rojas is batting two thirty nine on the year. Okay. Marsh is batting two thirty five. Yep. Stott is batting two thirty two. So yep. you are so 100% batting, correct. Yep. He has a higher batting <laughs> average, but yet he was the one who got benched last night. Like, if you're, you're Rojas, welcome. you got to be feeling some sort of way, don't you? You're welcome for that nugget, by the way. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a nugget by me. There. That, that so, might be the nugget of the day. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, last night, one through five, I think, was a combined one for 19. Uh, so they weren't doing anything. That's why you're adding Casty to the top of the lineup because your top five hitters were combined one for 19 last night. Nobody's hitting. And I'm not going to put all the blame on Taiwan Walker. I thought he was fine no, last he was night. Fine. He, he, he was fine. He's a fifth starter who eats innings. You don't have to worry about it. He, he was okay. The offense didn't score a run. Offense did nothing. So I, I, I can't sit here and say, yeah, let's keep the let's keep the lineup the same, and you know we'll just put a Mundo into no put Castellanos up there. If Castellanos is going to be one of your guys to get a base hit to start off the game. I, I'm all for it. Schwarber's been your mo- one of your most consistent guys. Have Castellanos behind him. Just create a spark in the beginning of the game, top of the lineup. I'm all for that. This is not something I would say go forward with and like go into September and October to have Castellanos bat in second. That's not what I'm saying. I think for tonight and the circumstances, having Cassie bat two. Is all good. I'm not. I'm not opposed to it all because I. They need a spark. They needed to make just a change and do something. 
All right, what's your second nugget for us today? All right, second nugget number two. We're going to switch wait, really, really quick. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, can I just ask you, can I ask you a question really quick? Yes. Yeah. So cause I said last hour, and I got some criticism for this. I said, this is the reason why baseball is not my favorite sport. Because baseball makes the most random lineup changes. Like, football doesn't do that. Like, nobody wakes up on a football Sunday and is like, well, A.J. Brown hasn't been catching the ball. So we're just going to bench him. You know what I mean? Like, in hockey, like, you might move a guy, like, to the third line from the first line. But, like, you never put in, like, some random guy in on the first line just to see what happens. Like, in basketball, you never be like, you know what? Joel Embiid, he needs a different guy playing next to him, a power forward. So we're going to bring up a guy from the Blue Coats who has, like, never played an NBA game and put him in the lineup. Like, it's only in baseball where it's, like, Hey, here's a random lineup, and it makes you want to vomit. Like, you never do that in other sports. See, I I am with the criticism that you have taken today. I totally love the randomness of baseball. That's what makes baseball so great. You need Mr. Consistency over there and have the same lineup every single night. All right, Josh. It's not about the same. Point. It's not the same. It's about the randomness. It's the, yes. That's it's what the, makes baseball amazing. That's why it's the best sport. That no. is why it's the number one sport, Josh. That's why it's not my favorite. I can't stand. See, there's no reason why Marsh should be in the lineup and Trey Turner should be out the lineup you're taking oh, one out you're taking both it. out of the lineup yeah i'm i'm with you they just have no depth in the outfield that's the problem it's not my there. problem <laughs> austin hayes is hurt i mean weston wilson's hanging more. out he's 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 uh, combing his beard man i i understand weston wilson's there but you know i mean it's not a great option either compared to brandon Moore. Well, it's not it's not like, great. well according to you austin hayes isn't a great option either well, that's a whole that's a whole different conversation. I mean, we we want to go back to the deadline conversation. That, that's a totally different uh stratosphere when we're talking about the lineup. But but you don't have Austin Hayes. You're gonna start Austin Hayes no matter what. You traded for him, he's gonna play left field, and you're gonna platoon Marsh and Rojas in center. So I mean you're kind of stuck at this point. Go back way, to where you were before the trade. By the way, Chris from Millville chimes in on the text board. He says, I love Nick's nuggets every day, but if Castellanos has to be the Philly savior, you are in the deep, if you know what it's, I mean. It's not. It's, it, listen, I appreciate <laughs> the the kind comments about Nick's Nuggets, but it's not like it's a permanent thing. Okay, it's just something to get them a victory, just spark something on the offensive side of things because nothing is happening. They can't do anything at the dish. The approach has been terrible. The at bats have been terrible. They can't score runs. Runners in scoring position. I mean, you just have to do something. This is not a permanent thing. It's a one game type of deal to just try and give this team a spark somewhere because Turner has been one of the worst players in baseball at the plate for since the all-star break so you have to do something i'm okay with castellanos play, uh, hitting in the two hole for one game against the marlins in august it's fine don't freak out i mean i mean i'm kind of freaking out overall but for one game just to just try and build something and get you going you have to have Casty in the two hole, Josh, not Edmundo Sosa. All right. So what's nugget number two? All right. We'll move on to nugget number two. We'll switch gears to the birds. I don't know if you saw this report. Uh, NBC Sports DC content creator JP Finley, uh, apparently was talking to Derek Gunn, uh, about the Eagles. And I found this absolutely fascinating, Josh. So apparently, I mean, we've all heard of Big Dom. Okay. Big Dom, the security guard, got suspended last year uh, for, you know, the, I guess it was what, during the San Francisco game. And now apparently uh, he's basically running the show. Uh, the, the tweet was talking with at Real D Gun about the Eagles vibes right now. Big Dom basically runs the show. Big Dom, Big Dom has them all on the same page right now. I'm not Joking. So is Big Dom the head coach or is Nick Sirianni the head coach right now, Josh? I mean, we've heard how important Big Dom is to this team, which is it's great. It's great. But like, what the heck does that mean? Like, is Big Dom coaching everybody? And we've we're like we've heard glowing reviews from Jason Kelsey, play, past players, Bo Allen, who's been on 97.3 ESPN before all of these guys. He's got the vibes rolling. Like, what is that? All right. So a couple of things I want to address here. Number one. I think this this report is – I think it's mischaracterizing Derek Gunn because I can't see – I mean, I've, I've gotten to know Derek Gunn a little bit over the years. 
Derek Gunn is not the kind of guy to put out information that's salacious or that's hot takey or oh. that's going to be, you know, like, you know, like Derek Gunn was literally criticized by people because he would like downplay reports that were like sensationalized. So I got the feeling that this this report of what Gunn said might be might be mischaracterizing what he's saying a little bit, just knowing who Derek Gunn is. When he says that Big Dom is running the show, I don't think he's running the show in terms of, like, he's running the coaching staff or he's, like, running the organization or he's running practices. Or I think what they mean is because Big Dom's position now is basically he's the assistant to the general manager, basically. So, like, I think Big Dom is basically taking, like, an overseer of, like, things, role. I don't think he's walking in the Sirianni's office and telling him here's your hype speech for the day. Like I don't think he's the guy walking into the, the team meeting saying if CJ Garner Johnson makes his basketball shot, there's no team meeting today. Like I don't think Big Dom is doing any of that. I think that I think that what they really mean is that Big Dom's role right now is basically he's he's keeping things keep moving. Like he's keeping everybody moving forward. Like, I think he's the guy who might walk into a meeting every once in a while and just put his hand up and be like, look, guys, we're, we're trying to move forward with this organization. Let's not focus too much on the past. Let's not think about yesteryear. You know, Jalen, if you get a question about last year, move, keep it moving forward. Like, I think that's more of what his role is. I don't, I don't think he's literally like, you know, at practice – you know, with a, with a headset on telling Sirianni no, what to he, do. No, 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 no. He's not an X's and O's guy. He's a vibes guy. He's a glue guy. He's a Mr. Everything like you, Josh. He's does it all. He's Mr. Do it all. He's got horrible pizza deals. taste, but. <laughs> yeah, no, you've talked about that before. But like, I mean, he, he's, he was a mystery guy kind of before. Now, I mean, since he got suspended, the, he was in a, you know, thrust into the Oh, he's a celebrity spotlight. at this point. Yeah, but. Uh, apparently, you know, he does background checks. He's got connections around who, he wherever. He's it's, Mr. Everything. He's, he's a, like Josh Henning. He's in important. Sense. But, like, for example, Josh Henning is not the brand manager. He's not the station <laughs> manager of 97.3 ESPN. That's Mike Gill. Mike Gill is my boss. There's right. never a point in time where anyone is going to act like that I'm telling Mike Gill what to do. <laughs> and I think that is the insinuation of this report, that Big Dom is telling Nick Sirianni what to do. I guess you, if you, if you, I guess you saw it that way. I just kind of see it as like he's connecting with these players on, on a different level in not, not an X and O's way. But see, way, you're, but like but you're saying room. that, Nick Earnshaw, because you're not an idiot. Okay. There are people <laughs> who will read this report and take it not the way you and I are taking it. And that's the gripe I have with this. JP, whatever the heck his name is. JP I, Finley. Whatever. NBC Sports, uh, Philly, or NBC Sports DC. Well, he's, he's obviously trying to be salacious because Derek Gunn does not, he would not verbalize it the way JP is creating it. Right. No, well, I, by the way, that might have been the nicest thing you've ever said to me, Josh. I really appreciate it, man. <laughs> which, which part? <laughs> the, the part I'm not an idiot. I really appreciate oh, okay. that. I genuinely appreciate that for sure. But no, I'm, yeah, I mean, this, I thought it was fascinating because then you know, I'm seeing stories and it was generating a big discussion on on the Twitter X platform, too. So, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. How, how big a role Big Dom does have uh, with the Philadelphia Eagles. All right. Final nugget of the of the day. You know, obviously, you mentioned the top of nuggets. And, I mean, I'm going to a concert tonight. I will be in the uh, vicinity of Citizens Bank Park, but I'll be across the street. I'll be enjoying it. Future and Metro booming. Okay, Josh, you know, they were the ones who kind of sparked the, the Drake and Kendrick Lamar beef. So I'm excited to go to that concert. I'm going to see that song live. You know why? The only reason why I know who that is because of the Spider Verse movies. Yes. They're, they're on the soundtrack of both Spider Verse yep. movies. Yes, That's the only are. reason why I know who that is. I will be enjoying myself and not be across the street watching the Phillies and watching that painful uh, game of baseball that you so happen to disagree with all the lineups and, you know, they've been going down. Uh, yeah, essentially, you know, the new album is called We Don't Trust You. I'm not trusting the Phillies right now, Josh. That's for sure. No, I, th I think you made a good decision because now the Phillies have a chance to win the game, too. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be there. Like exactly. I said, I didn't, I'm not, and I'm not in the nosebleeds. I'm not at a You're not even in the event. city. You're not even in nope. the city. You're in Camden. Nope. 
No, no, it's at the Wells Fargo Center. Oh, oh now Fargo. we might be in trouble. There might be a residual. No, 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 no. The distinction was I'm not attending any Philly sports events in the nosebleeds uh, in, the, in the month of August. Not in the concerts were were not off the table. Okay, all right, all right. I'm just trying to trying to keep up here, man. Trying to keep up. You got to keep up, Josh. Keep it up. All right, that's my final nugget of the day, Josh. <laughs> Before I let you go, really quick. Yeah, go ahead. So after this concert tonight, mm-hmm. is there another concert that you're trying to get to this year? Like, is Nick Earnshaw eyeing up another concert before the end of the year? I have not eyed up any other concert this year yet. I might have to do a deep dive and see who's coming around. I missed the Green Day concert, a little bummed about that. Right. But other than that, no, I got nothing on my plate uh, as of now. I'm just curious. I mean, you're, you, it's always interesting because Gil is like, you know, he's Generation X. I'm Millennials. You're Gen Z. So it's I'm like, a zoomer. you know, we, we all, we all have like different like interests music wise that we lean into. We so, do. you know, like I, I would never like, there's never a day where like someone would have been like, Josh, go buy the tickets for the concert you're going to tonight. You know what I mean? Like I would, <laughs> you know, um, but that's me. So I mean, yeah. I'm just I'm just trying to figure out what's what's on the Nick Earnshaw itinerary when it comes to the concert next on the lineup. You know what I mean? I got nothing. I got nothing. I haven't even looked. This is the last one I kind of looked at for for the summer, and I'm going to attend it. Maybe there'll be another one that, that comes up uh, soon that I'll, I'll attend. Who knows? All right, I was curious. Well, you know, it's you you get added to the list of things we could talk about on Friday when you sit in with me. On a happy hour Friday here on the Sports Bash. He's Nick Earnshaw. He'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Nick's Nuggets. All right, Josh. I'll talk to you, man. Have a good one. Nick Earnshaw here on 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hedding filling in for Mike Gill. And, of course, this hour of the Sports Bash being brought to you by the Gallery Bar Book and Games. Go to the gallery. Go to Ocean. Go for the win. This football season, the gallery at the Ocean Casino Resort is where you want to be. For more information, go to OceanAC.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, coming up next, Matt Gell from The Athletic. He will join us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. We'll talk more about the Phillies. By the way, great pull by the texter. Chris in Millville says, Lou Gehrig was a random replacement player, and look what happened. He's right. What if Weston Wilson is the next Lou Gehrig, and we just kept him on the bench? Obviously, I kid. I kid. More Sports Bash next on 97.3 ESPN. This is the Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the 97.3 ESPN free mobile app. Now live from inside the Ocean Casino Resort Studio, here's Mike Gill. Josh Eric Fillion from Mike Gill here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN, in the 5 o'clock hour, being brought to you by Key Acura of Atlantic City. Go see Rocco and the team at Key Acura of Atlantic City on Toten Road in Egg Harbor Township. Your small but friendly dealer. Check out their full inventory now at keyacuraofatlanticcity.com. You know, I purposely picked Green Day's Boulevard of Broken Dreams because if you ask Philly fans right now, they're acting like the Philly season might already be over and it's August 14th. And yet I remind people as we bring on Matt Gelb from The Athletic who covers the Phillies, the Phillies had three five-game losing streaks in 2022 and they went to the World Series. Not that that's an excuse, but maybe a little context. Matt, welcome in to the show. How you doing today? Hey, uh, good weather. Be a big crowd. Maybe they'll win. Maybe they won't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's Italian Heritage Night, so it'll be a good crowd, right? <laughs> and they get a good crowd no matter what night it is right now. I mean, it really is crazy. It, it, let's get on that for a sec, because you mentioned about how no matter what, they're getting the good crowds. Like we talked about a couple of years ago here that, you know, it felt like the Philly fan had to be, you know, convinced to come back to the ballpark, right? Now they got some of the best tenants in baseball. So it seems like people are, are again, they're coming to the ballpark, but is it maybe less to do with the team on the field and more about being in the ballpark again? 
I mean, I, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I know they haven't played well of late, but um, this is a team that still has a lot of star players that, you know, when they're right, they play an exciting brand of baseball. And I think um, that is attractive to people. And, you know, you mentioned the, the, the five game losing streaks. I mean, I would take it even a step further. And I think, you know, going into the season, what was all the talk about? It was about getting off to a hot start, getting off to a hot start. And they accomplished that. They got off to an unbelievable start. It's funny, though, because in their last 60 games, they're 28 and 32. It's not a good record. But in the first 60 games of last year, they were 28 and 32. And it's almost as if, like, the opposite of last season has unfolded this season. And like you said, it doesn't really make – it's not a good excuse, but it does add some perspective here in that they have six, seven weeks here to make this thing right to hit their stride before October comes. And are they going to do it? I don't know. But to suggest that, you know, because they haven't played well now doesn't mean they're going to win in October, I just – I think it's kind of foolish. Phillies definitely did a little shake-up with the lineup today. Trey Turner on the bench, Castellanos in the two-slot – Sosa playing shortstop. Do you think that this shakeup is the kind of shakeup that makes sense for a Phillies team like this right now? Or do you think this is just them kind of blindly throwing darts at a dartboard? No, I mean, I think it makes sense to give Turner a day right here. I mean, he's just, uh, he's swinging at everything right now. And, and it's not a good matchup for him tonight. That the Marlon Sir, Edward Cabrera has got great stuff, but he really is a guy who, um, you know, throws a lot of pitches out of the zone. He will make you chase. And right now, if you watch three turners at bat, it's pretty obvious, like, what the scouting report is and what the plan of attack is. I mean, it's a lot of breaking balls, off-speed stuff, and a lot of it is down and away. And he is swinging at just about everything right now. And so I think it's a good day for him to just not think about baseball, just, like, not play. Uh, it gives Castellanos a little reward getting over the two-all and, Tomorrow, like I expect Turner to be batting second and playing shortstop. It does not sound like this is going to be a thing where he's coming back and he's batting lower in the lineup. Uh, I think this is just a day to try to reset Turner because we know that he's better than this. I mean, he knows it. We all know it. So if they're trying to reset Turner today, is it possible that maybe they try to reset Marsh tomorrow in his last eight games? He's batting 080. So after that hot, you know, he Marsh goes to Stone Harbor, Matt. Then he comes back, he hits a couple home runs, starts hitting great, and then he goes into this slump in the last eight games, so he's on an up-and-down trajectory as well here. Yeah, I don't think he's going to play a lot this weekend. Um, they're going to face quite a few lefties, I believe, against Washington, and uh, I think that's why he's playing tonight is because he's not going to play a lot this weekend. Gotcha. Like three out of the four games against Washington are lefties, and he's not going to play. And, and honestly, he hasn't hit righties either. I mean, this is a this has been a slump now that, Honestly, you probably call it more than a slump. I mean, this has been three months now, Marsh really not producing the way he should, especially against righties. You know, even if we acknowledge that he's not going to hit lefties enough to get playing time, he's got to hit righties, and he just hasn't done that. He really hasn't made enough contact at all this month. Uh, it's it's a problem, and uh, because of that, uh, I think he's I think he's going to be sitting a lot this weekend. You mentioned uh, that they got Patrick Corbin on Friday, make. Uh... Mackenzie Gore on Saturday, two lefties, and also um, I believe it's All Mitchell right. Parker is a lefty yeah. as well. So that's yeah. that's three straight yeah. days, no Marsh potentially in the lineup. So if it's no Marsh in the lineup, Matt Gell from The Athletic joining us here on 97.3 ESPN. If it's no Marsh in the lineup, what does that mean for Bryson Stott? We're going to see. Uh, I'm going to guess that he doesn't play all of those games. I mean, maybe he sits two of them. Maybe he sits all of them. I mean, might, some of it might depend on the at-bats tonight that they see from Sosa and from Stott. Um, they like Sosa against lefties, and for good reason. His production has been there. Gives them a little spark. I wouldn't be surprised if Sosa plays a lot this weekend. Matt, you mentioned about them playing the Nationals this weekend. I think a lot of people looked at them coming back home as, man, that was a tough road trip. Now you got the Marlins and the Nationals, and then they lose yesterday 5 nothing, and people are now... They're starting to sweat. And yesterday, I said at the earlier in the show, Matt, I said the the word of the day is frustrated. You know, Rob Thompson mess, mess, message um, gave the message about being frustrated. Schwarber said they're frustrated, not worried. Is is that a fair assessment of this team right now? That they they're just trying to get through this situation. They are frustrated, but they will come out the other side. 
There's definitely a lot of frustration. I mean, because they know they're better than this. I mean, I think we do too. I mean, this is not a team. Certainly, they're not a team that was. You know, they were on pace for 112 wins for a while, and they're they're not that team. Um, and now they've been the second worst team in baseball since the All Star break. I don't think they're that team either. I think they're obviously somewhere in the middle, and. I think they are one of the better teams in baseball. They have not played like it for a while, and that can be a frustrating thing. Uh, you expect them to go through a skid. I mean, I think we knew that they would. What, what is frustrating for them and for the people who watch them is that this has gone on longer than it should. And everyone has acknowledged that, and it's not like they're sitting there saying, oh, well, we're going to get through it. You know, we're, we're better than this. We're going to get through it. There's, been, there's a lot of work and meetings and uh, – practice like you know has gone into trying to get out of it and um you know i mean they 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 need to see a ball go over the wall i think i mean they haven't hit a home run in 29 innings now Um, not to say that this offense is just completely dependent on the long ball but it certainly helps and i think you just see a lot of guys trying to uh just do everything with one at bat that that's a great point about the home run though that's a great point because You know, this is a team that has a lot of money invested in a lot of power hitters. Schwerber, Turner, Castellanos. I mean, these guys, they're, they're not, you know, single hitters. You know, these are power hitters. These are sluggers, right? These are guys who have been able to generate power over the years. And even Real Muto's got power in his bat. So I think that's a great point. Like if this team, can at least get one guy starting to showcase some of that power. You know, maybe the other guys can like look at that and be like, "All right, you know, we're we're coming back around." Yeah, I mean they they're not expecting every guy to be you know going hot at the same time. I mean, you also don't expect every guy to go cold at the same time. And for the most part, the lineup has gotten cold. I mean, Kyle Schwarber is, is it for power has gotten on base here this month. Bryce Harper's swing seems to be coming around. Alec Bohm has been okay. Other than that. I mean, there really hasn't been anyone who has produced. And that's a tough way to live, especially when you're pitching. You know, it looks a little shaky right now. Uh, they they just they need something to go right. Uh, and, and I honestly thought in the middle of that road trip, I mean, they really did play better baseball. Uh, and then it just it did not end the way that they hoped it would end. And then it kind of carried over into the game last night. Matt Gell from The Athletic joining us here on the Sports Pass. Josh Henning, Philly for Mike Gell on 97.3 ESPN. Check out all of Matt's coverage of the Phillies in The Athletic each and every day. Also on the Twitter platform at Matt Gelb. Matt, you know, I wanted to see from you because you mentioned about that road trip. You know, I felt like there were a couple games they could have and should have won, right? Like the Saturday in Seattle when they lost in the 10th inning. You look at the uh, game Friday night in Arizona when they lost 3-2. It really does, to me, at least feel like if they would have won those two games, you know, maybe we would be feeling a little differently about this team. Is that a fair assessment? I mean, yeah. I mean, had they won just, you know, they, they had a chance to have a 500 trip had they just won one of the last three games in Arizona. And I think it would have definitely had a different feel to it. And I think it's the way they lost. You know, those last three games in Arizona, it was uh, – you know, walk off Friday and then two blowouts Saturday and Sunday in which they really were not in the games. And, uh, yeah, it definitely left a bad taste, I think, in their mouths because it was a decent trip up until that point. It wasn't perfect, but it was decent. And, you know, they'd gone through the tougher part of their schedule. They'd come home, and uh, really they just laid an egg last night. And uh, there are no excuses for it because, uh, you know, I just feel like it was it is time for them to pull out of this. Um, they're a better team than they've played. Uh, but somebody's got to step up. I mean, they're kind of waiting to see who's going to step up, who's going to put them on their back and kind of get this thing rolling again because uh, they they just they need to see a few things go right, and I feel like it would just get everybody on the same page, but it hasn't happened yet. Matt, I wanted to flip it over to the pitching staff. Uh, what is the latest on Ranger Suarez? Because we saw Taiwan Walker return last night and. He's Taiwan Walker. No one's expecting him to come out there and be some elite pitcher, but he's an innings eater. That's what he's really here for. But the guy that they really people want to know about is Ranger Suarez. So what is the latest on him and when can we actually expect his return? He's going to throw a sim game again Sunday here at the ballpark. He's going to get up to about 80 pitches in that game. And I think that puts him on track really to be back uh, two weekends when they go to Kansas City. Uh, it seems like all signs are pointing to that. Uh, he has not reported any issues 
with the back. I think they've used this time really more than anything to give him a longer pause and to make sure that this guy is not only healthy, but also sharp going into October. And um, even when, even if he comes back next weekend, he's going to end up making probably getting to a career high in innings for this season. And I think they're just looking out for him. It seems like he's on track. You mentioned the game in Kansas City. I believe it's uh, August 25th. There's still no starter announced for that game. So would the Phillies use Suarez opportunity to maybe bump everyone else down in the rotation? Or would it be swapping Suarez literally for Tyler Phillips, you think? I think it remains to be seen. Probably depends on how Phillips switches tonight and also in his next one. Uh, they could go to a six-man rotation. They could uh, skip somebody. I think a lot of the, I think pretty much every option is kind of you know out there for them right now. It's going to depend on how things go in the next ten days, week to ten days. And, and part of the reason why I'm asking is because you know Christopher Sanchez, he obviously has had an amazing first half of the season, but he has been solid, not elite like he was at times in the first half. Aaron Nola has had a couple up and down starts. You know, the only guy who's really been consistent is Zach Wheeler for the most part. And even he's had his moments where he has not always looked like Zach Wheeler. So I'm just trying to – I know that Nola and Wheeler have verbalized, Matt, that they don't like the six-man rotation. But maybe not a permanent six-man, but maybe just using Suarez coming back as opportunity to go through a six-man for at least one go-around to give everyone at least an extra day before the September stretch is kind of like what I'm thinking. I mean, I think that's in an ideal world, that is what they would do. They would go to a six man for maybe two, three turns through, um, give everybody some extra rest, make sure that everybody is healthy. I think it's just going to, it's going to depend, depend on the standing. It's going to get to depend on if they have six effective stars they feel like they can use. Uh, there's just a lot of different things that's going to depend on. What is your take on the bullpen right now? Because you know how Philly fans are. You know, they they see the bullpen and they're all pining for the days of Brad Lidge and, you know, having guys with literal roles in the bullpen. And the way you know, the Phillies run this bullpen, it, it's not the traditional fans' way of looking at a bullpen. So give us a little context on the roles these guys have in the bullpen and how you think they'll be used moving forward. You know, I mean, I think some of these guys have hit a, hit a bit of a wall. You know, I, I think there was uh, Kaufman and Strom, Kirkering, all three of them, you know, were outstanding for the first few months of the year, and you kind of expected them to uh, have a little regression. And I think it's kind of all happened at once, which has made it, you know, difficult for the Phillies because they're, they're trying to find the right guys to use in the right moments. And there's not a lot of guys who are going great right now. You can add Alvarado to that list. Uh I think Estevez has been fine since he's come over here. He hasn't had a ton of save chances, so it's hard to say that he's really been tested. But, uh, you know, they, they, they believe in these guys. And I think when you stack up their bullpen to everyone else, all the other contenders, it, it, it's right there. I mean, I just think that I think some of these guys are, are, are have hit a wall. And, uh, you know, better now than later. I mean, I think that they're trying to, to find a way to get these guys, make sure they get a little extra rest, make sure that, uh, they can kind of fix any mechanical issues that they have going on. But uh, I don't have a huge concern about some of these guys. I think this is kind of the ebbs and flow of the season. Like, I just did not expect Jeff Hoffman to have a .98 ERA all season. Like, I didn't think right. Matt Strom was going to have a 1.2 ERA all season. And um, There's definitely been uh, – it's been harder and more – probably more accentuated because they've all kind of gone, you know, downhill at once. Matt, before I let you go – when they expand the rosters in a couple of weeks in September, what do you think they're going to do? Uh, no idea. <laughs> I haven't even thought that far. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know. Probably, uh, you know, they could add another catcher. Rafael Marchand could come back. Uh, you know, the, you get one hitter and one pitcher basically now. The, the, the roster expansion is pretty is pretty limited right. with the new rules. So uh, I'm sure they'll add another long reliever type. Uh, that would make kind of using a six-man rotation easier in September if they want to do that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, kind of, yeah, I mean, it's going to depend again on, on how, how things are going come September. It feels, I know it's close. It doesn't feel that close though. I mean, I'm asking because like we've seen Kobe Allard up here. We've seen Michael Mercado up here. We have seen guys already up this year. So like, is it those two guys? I'm wondering like, are they targeting Spencer Turnbull for September? Like that's kind of where my mind is going. I'm trying to like decipher like what they might end up doing because as you said, 
you know, how many weeks do they go with a six man rotation? Like who's even going to be in the six man rotation? Or do they just say, as you said, these guys are tired in the bullpen. Let's get another reliever in the bullpen. I mean, it'd probably be a long guy. I mean, I know that, that like they're hoping Turnbull becomes an option for them as a reliever in September, but he's, you know, been a little slower to get back on the mound than they expected. So um, that one remains to be seen. But yeah, I mean, I think they're hoping that he's a guy in September that they can, that they can use at least in some kind of reliever role. He's Matt Gell from The Athletic. Give him a follow on the Twitter X platform at Matt Gell and subscribe to The Athletic for all of his Phillies coverage year round. And he joined us right here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Matt, appreciate the time. Yeah, enjoy the game tonight, even if they lose, okay? <laughs> I'm good either way. <laughs> Matt Gell joining us here on the Sports Bash. Josh Henning filling in for Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN. Does a great job covering the Phillies for The Athletic. And you know, to his point about a couple uh, minutes ago when he mentioned about, you know, do how do they go with the six man rotation? Right. The idea being, you know, as I said, it's August 25th is the day right now that is an open slot. Now, in theory, that would be a start for Tyler Phillips. So it's the idea of Phillips pitches tonight. And then he pitches again in Atlanta on the 20th. Do the Phillies say to Ranger Suarez, you're coming back that day, but we're going to use you to bump everyone down a day. So then Phillips' next start would be on the 26th. And then Wheeler, Nola, Sanchez will all get bumped down an extra day. And then when they get back to Phillips again, and Suarez again, they go back to a normal rotation. It's just, it's just a thought because I, I agree with Matt Gelb a hundred percent. I think some of these guys pitching wise, they're tired. It's been a long season. They were used a lot. I told you guys for the all star break that Jeff Hoffman and Jose Alvarado both appeared in 42% of the Phillies games. Strom had appeared in 40% of the Phillies games in the first half. That's a lot of innings pitched for three guys who, let's be realistic, they are not your traditional elite pitchers. So if they can find a way to alleviate some of these guys and their the, the pressure, the strain, the innings, whatever you want to call it, I think it would be a smart move at this point. Again, Philly's back in action tonight against the Marlins. And as Matt Gell pointed out, three straight left-handed pitchers coming up on their schedule. Mitchell Parker tomorrow night, followed by Patrick Corbett on Friday and Mackenzie Gore on Saturday. So there's a strong possibility, as you heard, Matt Gell pointed out that you don't see Brandon Marsh for two or three days consecutively coming up. And that he said the theory was is that, hey, Marsh will play tonight, but he ain't playing in the next few days. So if that's the strategy, I'm more okay with the idea of Marsh playing and Turner getting the day off today. And the question, though, is who do you go with if the plan is to sit um, to sit Marsh for three straight days. I mean, are you playing Weston Wilson every game coming up? Because Cal Stevenson is a lefty. So I'm assuming he's not going to be the guy. Um, I don't foresee Austin Hayes coming back in the next three days. So do the Phillies go out there and say, Weston Wilson, you're going to play all three days? Do they tell Weston Wilson, you're going to play two of the three days? And then we'll play Brandon Marsh against Patrick Corbin because Corbin is having an abomination of a season this year. I mean, I got to tell you guys, there is nothing more perplexing in baseball to me. And I know this is a very random point. I'm I'm sure maybe only Steven Ventner cares that I'm saying this. There is nothing more perplexing to me than Patrick Corbin. This dude was at one point in time a coveted free agent. He was a pitcher who a lot of people thought very highly of years ago. There was conversations the Phillies would be in the mix to get him, right? This is a guy who 
when he went from Arizona to Washington, people legitimately thought that he was going to be a staple of that rotation for years to come. And it was going to be him and Scherzer and Strasburg, and they were going to be like a big three, right? And then they win the World Series. And the year they win the World Series, he has a really good year. Ever since then, this dude has fallen off a cliff, ability-wise. He has led the National League, I believe it's, uh, what, three straight years in losses? And his ERA every year is over five. Right now it's 598. And I believe it was like over a six a couple years ago. They paid this guy so much money, and his ability has just completely fallen off a cliff. He may very well be one of the worst pitchers, not, not the worst left-handed pitcher in all of baseball. And just several years ago, he was top five in the Cy Young voting. Like, how do you go from that level of elite to that bad? That might be the guy you tell Brandon Marsh, you're hitting against him. He stinks. We get Mackenzie Gore. We get Mitchell Parker. But Patrick Corbin, he stinks. He's trash. Just Brandon Marsh, you hit against him. Like, maybe that's how you don't start Weston Wilson three straight days. You, you tell Brandon Marsh, you're hitting against Patrick Corbin. Good luck. <laughs> Josh Eddick here on the Sports Bash, filling in for Mike Gill. 973 ESPN FM, 973 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle. Coming up next, we'll get back to the text board, 609-403-0973. I have some texts I didn't get to a little bit earlier in the show, so I'll get to those, plus some uh, news and notes from around the NFL to get to as uh, some more injury news impacting the NFL. We'll touch on that and more coming up next, 97.3 ESPN. Josh Hennig hanging out with you on a hump. You're listening. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. With Mike Gill. When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. Can't see him, but he talks to me. On 97.3 ESPN. Five o'clock hour of the Sports Bash being brought to you by Key Acura of Atlantic City. For a great car buying experience, go see Rocco and his team at Key Acura of Atlantic City on Tilton Road, located in Egg Harbor Township. Key Acura is your small but friendly dealer. Visit them online at Key Acura of Atlantic City.com. As I promise, it's a Weinberg Wednesday. Dave Weinberg joins us here on the Sports Bash as typically Dave joins me on game night. But because there is no game night tonight, Dave was kind enough to join us earlier here on 97.3 ESPN. Dave, welcome in. How you doing today? Doing well, Josh. How are you? Doing pretty good. So um, I got to admit with you, you know, I like talking baseball with you, Dave. But today is one of those days where I'm reminded how much I hate baseball. I got to be honest. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's like, okay, the Phillies have lost four straight games, right? Uh-huh. It's frustrating. And we're all frustrated. You're frustrated. I'm frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. Rob Thompson says he's frustrated. Kyle Schwarber says he's frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. So uh-huh. it's like, okay, the Phillies got to make a lineup change. And it's like, okay, we're going to bench Trey Turner. We're going to put Nick Castellanos in the two slot. We're going to keep Bryce and Stott who isn't hitting well, behind Alec Bohm. And we're going to keep Brandon Marks, who's hitting horrible, in the lineup. And I'm just like, why? Like, you know, like, you you know. I'm with you there. Like, only in baseball do people do random stuff. Like, there's never, like, a a week in the NFL where it's like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make random lineup changes. Or, like, in basketball, where it's like, we're going to put a random dude in the lineup at a position he doesn't play normally, right? Or in hockey. Like, you never see that kind of stuff. It's only in baseball where it's like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get weird. And the person you're benching is Trey Turner? That's that the guy. That makes no sense. Yeah. That makes zero sense. <laughs> zero. <laughs> bench, bench Brandon Marsh, who's sitting about, what, 
0-22. I don't know what he's hitting. He, he's um, hitting. He's hitting. Five. Oh, he's hitting. Oh, 80 in his last eight games. Put him. Sit him down. Why is he still in the lineup? I don't. That, that makes that makes zero. Stott's been struggling. He hit the ball pretty well last night, right at people, but pretty you know pretty well. But um, uh, that, that yeah, I'm with you there. That's that's very puzzling to me. I don't know why he would make those changes. That uh, that that makes no sense to me. It's just so. Now I will say I just had Matt Gelb on, and Matt Gelb says that he thinks the reason is, uh-huh. is because the Nationals have three straight left-handers going the next three days, and that the Phillies are going to sit Marsh for those I three days. Know. And I'm just like, if that's their reasoning, then they're overthinking it. Yeah, what, why? I mean, so you what? He can't sit today. I mean, what, right. is, what are the Nationals have to do with this? Because they had... for five games. I mean, he's been <laughs> really struggling. That's that's stupid. I just I don't understand. No, I'm with you there. I, yeah, I don't either. I mean, I understand winning cures all problems, but Dave, you know how it is. Like all of us think about. The, the 2022 World Series when they had this, the record for strikeouts, when the 2023 NLCS, when the offense completely ghosted us for game six and seven. Like, mm-hmm. these are the things yep. that stress Philly fans more than anything. And us being told it's the dog days of summer, it's a long season, everyone's frustrated. It's just not good enough. Yeah, I mean, they're going to win the East, I think. I mean, that barring a, the continued collapse, I don't see really happening for the rest of the season but um they, they're certainly not you know uh giving you much confidence going into the playoffs uh, the way they're playing right now and um i'm afraid it's going to be a repeat of, of last year or maybe even worse where they just you know regress even further and whether it's the first round exit or a second round exit at that um they're um <laughs> it's really it's tough to be a Phillies fan right now. It really is because, of, like you said, they keep letting you down, and you know they got off to such a great start. Everybody was hopes were all high, sky high again, high hopes, as you know Harry Callis would say. And <laughs> now they're just uh, back back into doldrums. It's um, uh, it's it's it's, really, it's it's tough to be a baseball fan right now. You're right. Yeah, and you know you you mentioned the regression because now that's a whole another set of like you know bad memories because. You know, when the Phillies won the World Series in 2008, they lost the World Series next year. Then they lost in the NLCS. Then they lost the NLDS. Correct. And it was like every year they got yep. worse, even though the roster looked better mm-hmm. at the beginning of the year. So now, see, now, Dave Weinberg, you're bringing up a whole other set of bad memories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, that was kind of like my thought process, of the fact that they went, were a step worse every year back then. And... um I'm afraid that's going to that's happening again. I hope not, but um, yeah, there's, there's, some, there's something definitely wrong with the team. I can't. Um, they they seem to have the talent. Obviously, they do, or they wouldn't have gotten off to such a fantastic start. But um, I don't know if it's a culture thing, if it's a, a dugout thing, a clubhouse thing. I don't know, manager thing. But um, something's clearly a, a awry here, and I don't know what they're going to do to fix it. I don't think that Benjamin Trey Turner's the answer. I mean, I don't think so either, but, you know, who knows? I mean, baseball's a weird sport, too. I mean, a, a, guy, a guy gets a day off, and all of a sudden he goes on, like, a 10-game hitting streak. Like, we, we've seen stuff like that happen before, so. Mm-hmm. True, true, yeah. I would think you'd so I, I don't know. I just, Trey Turner's not the guy that I would have benched, but I'm not <laughs> Rob Thompson, so well, he the, didn't the, ask me. The problem with Rob Thompson is, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, Dave, but, like, I look at Rob Thompson, and I know a lot of people are critical of him, but I keep reminding people, am I supposed to believe Rob Thompson is out there being a maverick, just doing whatever the heck he wants? Like, the reason why he's the manager is because the people above him, they agree with what he's doing. They're okay with what he's doing. Like, Dave Dombrowski has talked about how, like, him and Rob Thompson are on the same page, and, like, they, they're, they're very similar-minded baseball guys. Like, you know, we, people like us who are watching the game may not like what the decisions are made by the manager, but if the manager wasn't making decisions that people in the front office were okay with or approving of, do we really think Rob Thompson would be here? Right, right. I mean, that's the difference, I guess, with Joe Girardi and Rob, that he's willing to uh, buy into the philosophy that Dave Dombrowski was, was putting forth. And, right. Um, I, I, you know, I... Baseball managers really have a limited power to me. Um, you, you know, you set the, like, well, today he does by benching Trey Turner, but they generally, they set the lineup 
They're not calling pitches. They're not uh, devising strategy necessarily. I think it's more uh, pitching coaches. That's batting coaches. That's first base, third base coach. He's kind of like the facilitator, like the the overall manager, if you will. Um, you know, I don't know if it's fair to blame him. I guess he, I guess ultimately the blame falls on the manager, just like it does in a coach and head coach in football. But um, you know, he's. He's there because Dombrowski wants him there, like you like you said, and he's um, he's willing to do what they want him to do. Dave Weinberg joining us here. Extra so I, point. The, I got off the train there, I think. Nah, so, you're fine. You're I fine. probably just got off the track then. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, Dave Weinberg joining us here on 97.3 ESPN. Extra point comms at 97.3 ESPN.com. Uh, Dave, I want to flip it over to the Eagles because you covered the Eagles for many sure. years. And I want to get your perspective uh-huh. on this because, you know, the the Eagles had a good joint practice. You know how that works, quote unquote. They had a good practice, you know, with the Patriots. Yeah. And uh-huh. you know how some yeah. fans are. You know, the, the reaction of the fans are, well, who cares because they're practicing against the Patriots? Who cares if it was a good practice? You know, from your perspective of covering teams over the years, you know, does it really matter who you're practicing against? Oh, team-wise, no. I mean, the fact that you're practicing against another team, I think, certainly helps you. Um, you're not going to see the starters much, if at all, in the game itself. So the practices is where you get a better gauge of how your offense is progressing in your defense. So, um, And the, by that token, I, I think it is a, it's, it's valuable to practice against another team. You get a taste of where you are as a, as a, as a team. So, um, you know, generally, practice, training camp practices – are kind of boring, quite frankly. Um, but but the joint practices add a little bit of a, a flavor to it, a little bit of a spirit to it. Sometimes you get some fights here and there. I, I probably probably didn't have any this time, but um, no, uh, I think there's uh, definitely some value into that. It's funny you said that because sorry, no, what? no, there were no fights because apparently no. uh, the Patriots head coach Gerard Mayo and the Eagles coach Nick Sirianni apparently threatened the players. No fighting because they were worried that there might be injuries. Um, okay, yeah, I guess it's not like it was before. Obviously, where you know you would get they would drop the gloves, so to speak, uh, you know, every <laughs> other play and try to try to assert themselves. Wide receivers fighting with defensive backs, what have you. Um, they probably want a more uh, disciplined and controlled environment there. So, yeah, I, I can see where they would probably not want to risk injury by by doing that. I mean, I've never seen a serious injury with a training camp fight. They usually last about all five seconds, but um, you know they have their reasons, I guess. Well, Gerard Mayo, because, you know, Mayo used to play in, in the league. And uh-huh. he, he, ex- oh, yeah, he, he explained to the media, he said that he told his players that if a starter got into a fight, that the starter would have to play every snap of the rest of the preseason. Wow. <laughs> that's yeah, I can see where they would, uh, that's incentive not to, not to do that. Yet. And yeah, nobody wants to play in the preseason. And, and then apparently the Eagles players were threatened that they would get fined. Um, even though they're not getting game checks yet, they were going to get fined on their first game check really? if they got into a fight. <laughs> that seems a little odd. Okay, I mean, I don't know if there's a, I don't think they have the authority to do that, but maybe they do. I would, I could see them pushing the sled the length of the field or something like that. Give it George Hedger and Hegman back in the day, but <laughs> that might be punishment enough. Well, if, if you ask Jordan Maialata, Jordan Maialata was on the Greenlight podcast. He said that rugby training camp was harder than NFL training camp. I don't doubt it. I mean, I watched, the, I watched rugby in the Olympics. Those, those men and women are serious, boy. Oof. That's yeah. a physical sport. Yeah, that that was the one thing Maialata said that was – he said the only thing easier – because it was, it was on Chris Long's pod. And he said the only thing easier at the NFL, he said, is that training camp at the NFL is easier than rugby. But he said – Everything else with the NFL has been harder, you know, was like a real challenge for him to learn. So, oh yeah, I mean, he never played football before. He didn't even have a buckle or chin strap. So yeah, I can imagine where it was a big, uh, a big challenge for him to get. You know, he learned uh, just learned the rules of the game, uh, the in- intricacies of the game. So yeah, I can see where that would have been a, a really tough uh, challenge for him. Speaking of the Greenland Pod, Dave, I-, I wanted to play for you this one audio clip from Lane Johnson because you know Lane. Lane is. Lane speaks mm-hmm. his mind. You know what I mean? He, you know. Yeah, he's shoots from the hip, yeah. Yeah, so he made this comment about Vic Fangio. And I wanted to get your reaction to it because 
I thought this was a pretty eye-opening comment in a good way, but an eye-opening comment from a a player currently in training camp about Vic Fangio being the DCs. This was Lane Johnson on the Green Light podcast with Chris Long. We're so used to like you know basic defenses during training camp, and every now and then you would see a defense like his two or three times a year, maybe. Yeah. But now we're getting all the hard stuff and all of our hard calls out of the way. So when it goes back to you know playing other teams, it should be a lot simpler. What's your reaction to that? Well, he he says that they're all, they're facing defenses that they're like they're going to face during the year. Is that his? Well, he was saying that, that you know, typically, that in, a, so like he said, typically in the past in training camp, it's like very simple defenses you face. Whereas he said now Fangio is throwing everything at them in training camp, and he says now during the season it's actually going to be easier for them going into the year because they've seen everything already in training camp. Yeah, I can, I can see there's merit to that. I mean, generally in training camp, at least the ones that I've been to, it's usually the ones against the twos. You never see, you never, you very rarely see first team offense against first team defense it's usually first team offense and second team second team first team defense against second team offense it's, it's kind of that, that's uh that's kind of eye-opening that the Fangio would do that that they would you know match up mano a mano so to speak that, that's uh that's an interesting uh way to approach it and um i can see where that would pay off you know you're used to playing against the best of the best there and it, it makes you wonder dave because you know one of the issues arguably the biggest issue last year was the disaster that was the defensive coaching situation, right? And so it, it's almost right. like, you know, the Eagles and Fangio are coming in and being like, well, the defense was trash last year, so we're going to do everything different this year. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I could see they needed a brush of fresh air, a brush, breath of fresh air, sorry, and um, a change in the culture and, and change in the coaching staff definitely helps. Uh, same thing with Kellen Moore as the offensive coordinator. You needed a fresh set of eyes, a fresh way of doing things. And um, uh, it was clear that the, the, the team had, had uh, stopped listening to the coaches last year. So now you have two guys who are both respected in their fields and bringing, bringing new ideas, bringing some creativity to it. So, yeah, I can see where that, 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 that should pay off this year, I think. Dave Weinberg, Weinberg Wednesday here on 97.3 ESPN. Before I let you go, your latest extra point column was about the South Jersey High School, uh, mm-hmm. sorry, the South Jersey Lifeguard Championships, I should say. And, yep, correct, you, yep. know, I, you know, I, we, we had the broadcast here on 97.3 ESPN, and it was really wild that going into the final race, that literally it was a three-way tie, and that it really could have been anybody's championship. And I, I love the way you documented it on the article because – of the fact that, like, people don't realize that, like, these races really come down. Like, every single race matters for gathering points. Yeah. I mean, especially in the South Jersey's because there's only three events. Um, I've argued long, you know, long and hard uh, without success that there should be more. They should add some variety to it. Um, I think it's time to include women's events in it. Um, maybe even like a surf dash for, for, uh, the team purposes. But yeah, when, when you only have three events, every point matters. And like you said, I mean, the Avalon was fortunate to get a, you know, a huge effort from their, from their singles rower to, to pull out the win over, uh, Jack Savelle. And right, you know, congrats to them. That's the first time they've won since 2015, I believe it was, yep. but a really exciting event. I mean, people, if you never get a chance, if you have never had a chance to get to it, uh, make sure you go because it's, it's one of the truly unique sports in our area and uh, definitely worth a trip to watch and the best news of all is for you dave weinberg because when the south jersey lifeguard championships are next summer it's a shorter drive for you and there's free parking in avalon <laughs> oh is there okay awesome good very good well, there's free parking in brigantine too but yeah that's um yeah definitely a shorter drive Oh, uh, definitely a shorter drive. I mean, <laughs> your exit 13 versus exit oh, yeah. 38A. It's very, it's a very big difference. Correct. <laughs> yep. Yep. I mean, I, I yep. literally, I literally, <laughs> I literally live closer to Avalon than I do the radio station. Do you really? Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. Yeah. So then there's no excuse for you not to be there then. Well, it, it depends on if I'm Next working year. in the studio or not. So. Oh, okay. I got you. I got you. <laughs> yeah, th- th- this year because you know Mike Gill is in Virginia with his thirteen-year-old uh, baseball team, and I was having right, to fill right, in right. for him. There was no way I was going to be on location for the for the event, so we had to send somebody else out there to do the setup. 
Oh, uh, well, I got you. Yeah, duty calls. I understand. Yeah, it's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> yeah, just like lifeguard races, you got to, you know, walk on the beach with your bare feet and you want to get, you know, a little bit of a tan and watch, watch people race. It's, it's a really <laughs> tough job. <laughs> Dave Weinberg, at Dave Weinberg19 on the Twitter X platform, extra point columns at 973ESPN.com. Dave, appreciate you jumping on a little bit earlier with me. We'll talk soon. Oh, anytime, Josh. I appreciate it as always. I'll talk to you next week. Absolutely. Dave Weinberg joining us here on the Sports Bash. Josh Hedding filling in for Mike Gill on 973 ESPN. Or we'll wrap up the show coming up on the other side. We'll check back on the text board one more time. 609 403 0973. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat. Literally. But don't sweat it. Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1-800-GRANGER, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. The Sports Bash with Mike Gill on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. All right, wrapping up the Sports Bash here on 97.3 ESPN. Don't forget tomorrow night, Eagles, Patriots. Coverage begins at 6 o'clock tomorrow night on 97.3 ESPN. I'll be back tomorrow filling in for Mike Gill another day. By the way, uh, shout out to our winners, Jeff in Ocean City, Matt in Sicklerville, Shane in the HT, David in Violin. You are the winners of the tickets to go see Andrew Schultz at Ocean Casino Resort at Ovation Hall, Saturday, August 24th. They're going to the 10.30 show time. Uh, I've been told there is only a handful of tickets left for either the 7 p.m. or the 10.30 show times. So if you did not win tickets today to go see Andrew Scholes in concert and you want to go see the famous comedian, actor, and podcaster in person in Atlantic City, Go to theoceanac.com for more information about how you can purchase your tickets now before they completely run out. And thanks again to Ocean Casino Resort for supplying us some tickets to give away to our listeners here on 97.3 ESPN. Um, let's see here. What text did I not get to earlier? Oh, by the way, Steve Vendor came through. I mentioned about Patrick Corbin. He says, Patrick Corbin reminds me of Jordan Zimmerman's contract. He was never an ace, should have been paid one, but he does take the ball every fifth day, and Corbin's never hurt. Well, the problem is Corbin's never hurt, takes the ball every fifth day, but it's like you're paying him basically to stink. <laughs> uh, David and Violin chimes in at 609-403-0973, says, call Big Dom whatever you want if it helps win football games. Listen, there was a lot of speculation that Dom missing those couple games was a huge factor in the, the culture problems in the Eagles locker room. So maybe he is more valuable to the culture than we realize. Um, Jerry from Abseekin says, do you really think Rob Thompson makes the calls or is it above him when it comes to the lineup? I, I think it's above him. I, I think that I've always believed Rob Thompson does what he's told. I've always kind of ascribe to that theory. All right. Thanks, everybody, for texting in. Thanks to Dave Weinberg, Matt Gelb, Nick Earnshaw, Jeff Mosher, Mike Begay for all joining the show. And thank you for listening to 973 ESPN. I'm Josh Henning. been filling in for Mike Gill. Have a great night, everybody. I'll catch you tomorrow here on 973 ESPN. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat. Literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.